Welcome everybody to the, this is the fourth session of the, for the Eastern Region Virtual Short Course. Okay, the first speaker is John Nessel. John is a very good friend of mine, but let me talk about some of his uh, background. He operates a pruning and advisory business in Chattanooga called The Ornamenter since 2001. He has a degree in landscape design from Temple University, that's in Philadelphia. He is ISA's board certified master arborist. He provides property analysis and maintenance coaching, including legal documents. He is a popular lecturer for throughout the community here, master gardeners and professional organizations. So I'd like to welcome John Nessel to our program this morning. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I've uh, been honored to work uh, with Tom over how many years now? I don't know, but I've also taught with the uh, master gardeners who I I'm a big proponent of Master Gardeners. I think they are a great liaison between the professionals and the community. Um, so if we have a lot of Master Gardeners, I welcome you, encourage you, keep up the good work, do what you can. And I wanna thank Tom and Lee for putting this together. This is far beyond my technical proficiency. So I really appreciate you guys putting this stuff together and uh, look forward to uh, talking with everybody. So if I'm just gonna click on, we're gonna just move on to the slideshow. And uh, this is what you'll see, it's about pruning and trimming. That's who I am. What I wanna promote here is at the bottom, the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, and right here in the middle, the ISA, the International Society of Arboriculture. Also, the uh, besides the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, the um, Tree Care Industry Association, the TCIA, these are all good sources for information about tree care, tree and shrub care, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I would recommend to uh, anybody um, go to these resources as your best resource uh, for information about tree care um, and, and such. For professionals, um, it's very important that you be familiar with the ANSI standards, whether you're in lawn care or tree care or any profession, as a matter of fact. With the uh, ANSI standards, that's going to be the very basic beginning of standards, the minimum level of information you legally need to know if you end up in court. Otherwise, anything you have to say will not be really considered as a professional. So familiarize yourself with the ANSI standards if you're not already. There are a lot of other publications out there. This is one I rely on a lot. And once again, I want to reiterate to uh, many of our many of the people watching today here. Um, yes, I'm a professional. I've been at it for a long time, but the, I have not. I don't make this stuff up. The things I'm expressing to you are things I've learned from professionals like Tom Stebbins and uh, Dr. Douglas Earhart. I can see his picture right there. I, I, these are the professionals who do the research. Um, Ed Gilman and the University of Florida, Jim Clark. Th these people are the ones doing the research. I look up their research. I find their publications like this one, Structural Pruning, and I read those religiously and stick to them and use them as reference guides. So once again, it's not like I'm making stuff up. This stuff is out there. There's a lot of information out there. My only recommendation is if you have a personal friend with a Facebook post, follow up. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, old wives tales about doing this or doing that. Follow up and make sure that the information you're looking at is backed up by valid research and information. And that's why university departments like horticulture, agriculture, University of Tennessee, um, University of Georgia, University of Florida, places like this, Tennessee Tech, these are all good resources for information about pruning, trimming, and all that. So to move, to move on, if you have a naturalistic looking landscape, very much like this backyard, there's very little you have to do. You can just sit on that bench and enjoy the, the amenities of nature without having to do a whole lot. This happens to be the far back end of my backyard. I have to walk back to this bench. It takes a five minute walk to get to the backyard here, but I don't have to do anything back here except maintain the pathways. So once again, Maintaining and, and trimming and pruning is really a matter of how much do you need to do? Well, you know what? We'll put plants far away from their natural homes. We'll bring them right into where they do not belong. This happens to be downtown New York City. Now, all those Christmas trees there, all bald and burlap, and they'll be moved out at the end of the season. Um, the, uh, the moat down here at the bottom is all floating greens. And these are all evergreen um, boughs here that are kept green. So simply for the Christmas season, but this bank will pay thousands and thousands of dollars to have this kind of amenity put in just for the Christmas season. That's how valuable plants are to us as a human race, as a human species. 
And look, even, even just the smallest little bit, the smallest little bit, these hairy little weeping form cherry trees and this little patch of green down here, look how that softens the massive concrete structure that you have right behind that. Once again, downtown New York City, you don't think people sit on this wall on a regular basis? They absolutely do. We will absolutely put plants wherever we can put them because as humans, we have that connection with plants. But I want you to pay attention here a little bit. Um, these trees and these shrubs all share a good root space right here. There's a good amount of soil volume right here for all these trees roots and these plants roots to have resources to gain water and nutrients. That's important because to start off with, roots have to have room. Roots got to have room. This is from the uh, um, Chattanooga Forestry Division. This is their best management practices book that they give to developers. So Pete Stewart, who we'll be talking later is a part of this. This was um, mostly developed by Gene Hyde and some other professionals. But I want you to take a look at this picture here, this diagram, because this is important for us here in East Tennessee. This may not be the same root structure diagram in West Tennessee, because the fact of the matter is, root cell division will take place wherever there are the right conditions. Soil, oxygen, water, the correct temperatures, you will have root cell division. So roots have been found as deep as 650, 700 feet inside caves where water is dripping down through the, the limestone. Tree roots will grow wherever they can grow. So for our area, the diagram you see there is fairly typical because of the kind of soils we have. And the kind of soils we have, this can be pretty well or seen in this picture right here. Here you can see a bunch of arbor varieties. I was called in, you can see the, the little bit of browning, browning and tip damage in these arbor variety shrubs here. Well, look right here, that's all the soil that they have on top of what? Churd and clay and rut. There are no tree roots down here in this soil zone. You can see that. Nobody broke through the soil zone. They laid some actual turf stuff here and then just laid some mulch on top of it and put these shrubs on top. Well, why are the shrubs dying? They have no root zone area to build their roots. So this is fairly typical of our area. You have to break up these, root, these soil zones for drainage. Otherwise your shrubs are not gonna do well. Sometimes you have to do a soil amenity. Depends on what you're planting. But this is what we have to deal with. But um, that's a whole different class is soil sciences and things like that. So we're not going to delve into that a whole lot. This is fairly typical of the ornamental plants, the valuable, expensive ornamental plants that people pay a lot of money for. These are Japanese maples, of course, grown in containers. Well, it's 5, 10, maybe even 15 years down the road, they're in the ground when this kind of damage happens, where the root which is girdling around and wrapped around has now cut off the flow of water and nutrients because the tree has to grow. So the tree is dying up here, it's already dead. This tree actually went through several forms of death and rejuvenation on its own. But when we dug it out, this is the massive root system you have. That's not gonna keep a tree alive long-term. So grown in containers, when you take a tree out of a container, make sure that it is properly planted. And this is the result of what you find when you don't plant correctly. And this is the long-term. Over here, the picture on the left, that's ideal. That's what we'd like to see. The trunk flare above ground, all these roots growing out in the way, nothing circling around the trunk of the tree. Out in the field, the practical matter is if you can see the flare, the trunk flare and these roots exposed, that's a good thing. That's all good because that means the water nutrients being collected out here are being transported here without any cutoff. Over here, as this tree grows, everybody knows, tree has to grow, tree rings. Remember tree rings from high school biology. Well, these are at constricting straps here. So this is really fairly typical of trees that were planted incorrectly or they weren't planted at the, the proper depth. So that's what you wanna look for. If you see that in the field, this can be remediated, but you have to have really a professional do this. If you don't have good training on what to do with curdling or constricting roots, don't try to attempt this because you have a real good chance of killing the tree. But that's fairly typical right there of situations you can find. One of the things I want to stress is that when you have tree roots exposed like this out of the ground, many a client will call you if you're a professional and say, is this dangerous? This is simply an indication of our soil profile that I showed you before. We have a very shallow soil profile. So the roots will grow in the shallow part of the soil and as they thicken, add layers of cells every year, that's how they get exposed out of the ground. So that's how you can determine 
Is a tree dying and why is it dying? And if it's overall death. Bald and burlap trees quite often are wrapped up with straps and nylon straps and things like that. It does the exact same thing. I was called into this client and said these large arbor bodies, once again, planted by a client, uh, by a professional several years ago, well, they're dying and declining. Well, here's why. First thing I do is look at the base of the tree. So there's your first thing. You have constriction. You can see the trees going over it, the straps virtually killing the trees. Obviously, I cut off the straps as much as I could. The trees did survive. That's another thing I want to stress quite a bit. Plants will survive if you give them half a chance. The big problem is, as a professional, we called in when the problems are so obvious and so indicative of, okay, there's a real decline here, that there's not much you can do about it. There's not much you can do to fix it. But this is fairly typical, once again. So that's the basics of the roots. Make sure your trees are planted in the correct place, in the correct manner, and done correctly. Once again, the ANSI standards address all of that. If you follow just the ANSI standards, you will um, do things correctly. Now, as far as pruning and trimming, pruning and trimming is strictly a human effort. Pruning and trimming trees will shed their own branches as they need to. Trees in the forest will lose the lower branches from self-shading. That's fairly typical. If you've ever seen a pine tree in the forest, you'll see the top third of the pine tree, maybe the top quarter has green leaves. The rest of it has nothing, no branches. Tree's perfectly fine. It's absolutely fine. It produces enough carbohydrates to keep itself alive. So it's perfectly fine to have minimal foliage depending on the species. But as far as pruning and trimming, we're the ones that manipulate them. Why? Because we want them to be a certain way. Look at this hedgerow of shrubs right here. It's called the keyhole garden because that gateway is trimmed to be shaped like a keyhole. That's what that's the human manipulation. But this could be anybody's typical backyard. If you're a contractor, this could be anybody's typical backyard. You could have this in someone's backyard. This is fairly common. Here, someone says, well, look, I love these yew bushes in front of my cabin. I just don't want them to get bigger than the handrail. I don't want any sprouts above the handrail. Well, okay, you don't have to do anything here. These plants are perfectly happy and healthy. And in my personal opinion, that appearance right there coordinated very well with that cabin structure, you know, as far as like a landscape design element. But if you don't want it, okay, fine, you can trim them. In this case, it's the timing that's the more critical factor. And these are the two things I'm going to leave you with today, the most important things. With shrubs, with ornamental shrubs, the timing is a critical factor if you're gonna trim and prune. When you trim and prune is more important than how, because this, this time trimming here was done by hand, where you can grab a piece, like a, grabbing a piece of hair off the top of the head, snip it with the hand clippers and throw it out on the ground. You see all the debris out here. So it's easy to clean up. There's no debris caught inside here but it still has a sort of a naturalistic kind of appearance, not real tight and formal. The next picture will show you that difference there. But why is this done now? Look, there's no leaves on the trees back here. Do this in winter time because you wanna do this before the new growth comes out. The new growth will come right back up to the handrail or part way up to the handrail, and then you can trim to maintain the shape any way you want. But do your bulk trimming, your bulk pruning and trimming in the winter time on these evergreens where the flower is not important. Here's is another typical landscape, typical um, landscape in a uh, typical suburban garden, typical landscape home in a typical suburban home. And these are all just these uh, Japanese hollies, very much like boxwoods. Well, you're not gonna trim these by hand because look how many thousands of tiny little skinny stems. You can spend all day. I tell many of my clients, I charge by the hour and I do everything by hand. So I'll be glad to do this for you by hand and charge by the hour. It's not really practical, it's not really all that smart. But you can trim these. Trimming is indiscriminate cutting. It's not pruning with any kind of precision. It's not looking for things, it's just whacking. But it's okay, you can get away with this if you time it correctly. There's your nice, tight, formal trim cut. Now they're all gonna grow back, all grow right back out in the springtime. And once again, you can trim a little bit in the, in the late summer just to maintain that formal shape but they'll grow back up to about the middle of the window, which is fine, just let them go. And then the next winter, you can do it again. This is recurring work for anybody who's a professional that wants to, has a client says, I want these trimmed on a regular basis. Fine, trim them hard like this in the winter time, trim them lightly in the summer, and you can maintain that formal appearance for your client and do the least amount of harm to your plant, okay? That's the main key is that 
when the plants like these evergreens, like the yew bushes and the hollies like this, push out a whole lot of green, well, those leaves are the main food maker. That's the food maker for the plant. That's it. So the more leaves you can leave on there during the growing season, the best uh, chance the plant has to make more food, more carbohydrates. Once it's done all that, you can trim it back in the wintertime. And azaleas and other plants that flower, all you have to do is wait. Just wait till they flower. You can see this is a typical azalea. You can see the new growth has started to come out a little bit. The flowers have all turned brown. This client wants this thing trimmed as a regular trim shrub, a round ball of a shrub, which is perfectly fine. I am not here to judge what shape or form people like. That's up to them. What I am going to do is when my client says, I want these kept at this shape, because I'm going to time the trimming correctly. So if you're going to trim hedge clip sheer azaleas, wait till they bloom. And if you want to see that azalea, that's this one right here. You can see the edge right here where they started trimming, trim off a little bit. And here you are on this picture at the base of this tree is another azalea, which was trimmed. What I want you to take notice here is look on this. These are the boxwoods. They were trimmed in the wintertime. All that new growth has come out and you leave it alone. This, is, this has been done a month or two before all this, maybe January, February, March. So if you're professional, you can step up. This is work you do for your client in the winter. This is work you do for your client in the spring. So once again, with shrubs, the timing is the critical factor. Now, I always like to keep it round because that's a little bit more naturalistic looking of a shape. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't want it leggy underneath, you have to have the bottom branches exposed to sunlight. If you trim them so they're straight up and down like this, or if you trim them shaped like this, they're gonna self-shade and they're gonna get leggy. And if that's not what you want, make sure you keep, keep a rounded shape or what many people will call, typically call the Christmas tree shape. How you trim them is up to you. It doesn't really matter. You, you wanna do this, knock yourself out. You wanna use gas clippers, knock yourself out. You wanna use hand clippers, knock yourself out. Um, obviously, I think this is a setup because how does he move the crane to mow that? I don't know, but it's a nice silly picture. The key is how much do you wanna do? Now, once again, this is really typical a very common landscape design plan. A Nellie R. Stevens on the corner of the house. <laughs> okay, I've seen it virtually thousands of times. Usually it's a developer that puts in Nellie R. Stevens hollies and a bunch of Nandinas and a few other things that are really common like autolucan laurels. And if this is what your client wants, you know what? This is once a year trimming. You can see the picture on the left here. It just looks hairy. The client doesn't like the hairy look, fine. I've trimmed it down, it looks really nice and tight. Just to be bluntly honest, here what, the, once again, limbed up, the bottom limbs are taken off for that appearance, it's the lollipop tree. It's a personal preference kind of thing. If you're a professional, this is easy work, it's a hedge clipper. It's just not, that you don't have to make a whole lot of decisions, don't have to think a whole lot. So, you know, if that's what you want, knock yourself out. You just gotta decide how much do you wanna do? Because if you wanna do a whole lot, you can do all kinds of fun, fancy, just fanciful stuff. These are all hemlock trees. The one thing I want you to notice in all these topiaries is they're wider at the bottom. These are all wider at the bottom, so they're full all the way down to the bottom. But these are fancy topiary shapes that take a bit of time to keep and maintain. Once they're done, topiary shapes are not difficult to maintain once they're in place. But the, the effects can be quite dramatic. That's all hemlock hedge. And you can imagine the risk you're taking with hemlocks here, if we get hemlock woolly adelgid on the crane of this goose neck right here, and they just destroy this part, well, that's gonna pretty much destroy that goose. So they monitor these plants really religiously and make sure they do not get the damage that pests can cause, pest problems can cause, whether it's a disease or an insect. So once you do a, a topiary like this, it just takes skill and a little bit of patience to do the topiary. It is not expensive plants. It's usually very inexpensive plants like hemlocks. These are all yew bushes, these hounds. And this is what I find fascinating about this particular place. I'll let you know where it is. These folks are so skilled at this and so practiced at this that these yew bushes actually look like hounds, hound dogs, compared to a one that looks like a fox. And to me, if I could get it to look anything like a dog, I'd be happy. But once again, it just takes practice. But you can see exactly what it is. Here's the stems. This little bit down here would, of course, get trimmed off for visual effects. 
But as you can see, this stem right here, that's what forms the tail. So as these stems come up, they're getting trimmed off. You can shape it any way you want. And it is fun. And I encourage many of my clients, if you want to do this kind of thing, here's how to do it. It makes getting out in the garden a little bit more fun. Some of it can be really simple. This is really simple. These shrubs were allowed to grow off to this side. These shrubs were allowed to grow length on this side. The rest of these were cut right here. Three sails in the middle, bang, topiary. It's, it's easy and simple. So some things are not so difficult to see. That is a place called Dew Topiary Gardens. It's just outside of Baltimore. And I encourage anybody who gets up to that way. Like I said, it's about 10 minutes outside of downtown Baltimore in Moncton, Maryland. It's worth a visit. Um, here you can see it's a little bit more complicated what they're doing. This particular place, from my understanding, still sells. What they do is they build these frames, weld them together, put hinges on them, things like that, and then they'll sell the frame. Once this large yew bush starts to fill the frame where they want it to be, and they'll trim out where they don't want it, once that's done, they'll undo the pins on one side, hinge it open, and then they'll take the framework and sell it. And they have all kinds of frameworks, and they'll keep the bush there. But once again, it can be simple, it can be complicated, it can be, it can be fun. It's, if you want to get into topiary and trimming, but if you're hedge clipping and shearing most of your client's shrubs, that's basically a topiary. That's a topiary effort. That's all, that's what it is. But it's maybe just more simply shaped. Okay, so that's as much about trimming because it really is. It really is just hedge clippers, shearing, it's muscle work. You don't really have to think about where you're trimming. Timing is the critical factor. You can make a elephant topiary out of an azalea if you want to, just trim it after the flowers bloom. Now we're gonna move on to pruning. This is much more with trees, especially small trees like homeowners can get to, or if you're a landscaper, you're not gonna be climbing trees. This is the kind of thing you can do yourself at home if it's done correctly. You can see in this picture, the tree in back is one of the flowering cherry trees that has not yet been pruned. It's real thick and bushy, it looks like a shrub. And you can see in the tree in front, the pruning marks here and here and thinned out some of the stuff, but the structure of the tree has been maintained. And we only prune the low limbs off as it grows to make sure that we can get in and out of the house. Like right here, this is the tree, the low stuff getting right here. One of the things you always wanna remember is where a branch forms, that's where it stays. That's where it's gonna be. So the branches growing here, are gonna be right there in your face every time you go in, in and out of the house, also blocking the window. But with this branch here, these are going upward. So these are the ones we left. These are the ones we try to keep. Now these were pruned years ago. I pruned these are right, and this is funny because these are flowering cherry trees on Cherry Street in downtown Chattanooga. And this is what they look like a few years afterwards. Those trees are the ones down here, but I have pruned almost all of these along here. This tree right here on the left and this picture on the left is the one all the way down here. And we're looking the opposite way on, the, on Cherry Street. And once again, you can see they've been pruned around the building, up and elevated, you can get in and out. At, even without the flowers, they're gonna shade the walking sidewalk here. So when people walk up and down the sidewalk, they're gonna have the shade of the trees. They, they still have the great flower show. When you prune correctly, the tree has good structure and it's gonna be gorgeous. The, great, the really good thing for your clients and the way to sell this if you're selling this to a client is that if you do it correctly while they're young and small, as they get older, you do less and less and less pruning. So when they're mature size, you may not have to prune at all, even these cherry trees. Now, granted, sometimes you will have reactive growth from stems going towards the building as they parts of the tree get exposed to sunlight. But it's such minimal trimming in the future that it doesn't cost hardly anything. And your clients will love that because I have never come across a client ever, not once in almost 40 years doing this, no client has ever told me, yes, I want to spend more money than I have to on maintaining my landscape. Nobody's ever said it. Nobody, they always want to spend the least amount and with good reason, it's down, down on the list. Now, at home, can we do a lot ourselves? You bet we can. These three cuts were made with a lopper, now granted, the, the two cuts here, one, two, they're pretty heavy, pretty heavy cuts, but that lopper did it. And a lot of this stuff, you can see this low branch right here on the left, that curve right there. Well, I'm a pretty short guy. That one was hitting me in the chest. It's not going anywhere. Where that branch is right now, it stays there. Now imagine or picture that branch when it's this thick or that thick, and it will get that thick at that level. 
it's going to be in the way, especially if I want to mow around here. So I prune those branches off. There's a lot we can do as homeowners to get things up and out of the way. There are other structural elements up in the upper part of this tree that I would only ever let somebody who's trained and certified, like a certified arborist, to work on. But as far as like taking a, a limb off to get it out of the way from mowing, you can do this at home. It's not that difficult. You're going to be making branch collar cuts, which we're going to talk about even in more detail a little bit later. But one of the things I want you to be um, aware of, especially in maple trees, you can see after all this cutting, a little bit of sap bleeding. I've read a lot of research. It doesn't really hurt anything. If it's done in March, there may be some insects that go after this sap, but that kind of sap flow will stop in just a few days as the cells dry out and this tree will start in the spring with forming this callus tissue and wound for to close the wounds and you'll be just fine. So when pruning trees, what we want to try to maintain is the taper from a thick trunk to thinner branches. When you cut things off and you can see in each one of these circles, these trees were top down here initially. I got into the scene and started letting them grow. They were top again, right back in here. I had nothing to do with it. And then this topping right here was done by mother nature. Mother Nature killed the tops of these in 2007 when we had a freeze. So all we do is prune off the dead pieces and you can see the other pieces grew back. But these trees have much more strength, much more structural integrity than any tree that has been topped. Because the tree that's topped, well, even if it puts out growth, will be very weak connection. And I'll show you how that works later on. But here's what we really like to see ideally. Now, the good thing here with these three trees is you don't have to really do anything. They're out of the way of the mowers. They're over the garden. They're out of the way of the fence. They're up and up, leave them alone. You can tell your clients, there's very little pruning in here, maybe some aesthetics, maybe a few snips here and there for structural integrity, but low, low cost. Invest in it in the beginning and you really lower your long-term costs. Using unsightly techniques like this, this isn't pruning, this isn't trimming, this is hacking. This is just damaging an asset that this bank owns these properties. Now, here in the city of Chattanooga, the uh, commercial property is required to have trees every 35 feet or so. And some people might think, oh, well, they cut them down to make sure they can stay out of the power lines. Well, no, wrong and all. I mean, yes, the, the one is true. Yes, the city requires the trees to be spaced along there. And they have a good root area. So these trees can share all this root space. Everything's done right except for the topping. The problem is these trees are already small species trees. They're Chinese elms. So they're not going to get more than 35, 40 feet. They're not going to really interfere with the upper, um, upper wires. That's the power lines up there. These are the communication lines. They may interfere with communication lines, but they can be directionally pruned around those. And when they do this, you know what? You can look at these trees today. They've all grown back, as Chinese elms will. They've all grown back with a vengeance and are real thick and bushy. So now they're thick and bushy and weakly connected and have branches breaking out of them and twigs and more debris. So they have problems that they created just by doing this kind of cutting. So whenever you cut and damage trees like this, you cost your client more money. And I wanna thank um, Dr. Earhart um, for this picture on the right. <laughs> I don't know if he sent it to me directly or others, but uh, that's quite, he had quite a story behind that. The point being is that you can usually spot a non-professional. I mean, if, if you take a look, not just the guy up in the ladder, Take a look down at the base here. There's a guy down here, no helmet, no safety gear. He's ready to get dropped on himself. All their equipment, they're not moving that piece of equipment. I don't know where he's going after this. That's a pretty big chunk of tree on top there. I don't know where he's going from there. If it's roped, I mean, there's a rope going down over here. I don't know what the story is, except that's insane. To me, that's insane. Relying on your ladder to stay there when movement in the tree, anytime you remove parts of a tree, there could be, um, massive movement in the trunk. You want to take your chances like that? Now, this guy over here on the left, I have to put a caveat. This is in Italy, and I pretty much think that, that the owner of this building was doing this, so I don't think this is professional, but it just goes to show you, this guy doesn't know any different. Well, this guy didn't know any different either. Now, I don't know if he's bit this one over here and the, on the ladder is being paid or not, but I look at it this way. If they don't consider their own safety to that degree, how important is what I, what's important to me, to them? How important to them is what I want? It may not be very important at all because their own safety isn't even all that important. But doctor, thanks for that picture. I love that picture. I just, I see too much of this. And unfortunately, people can get injured. 
Topping is not pruning. Topping cannot be, it's not a good way. However, there are ways to reduce the height of a tree. Gene Hyde employed that effort when uh, the movie 42 was being filmed here in Chattanooga. They were filming a section of the old um, baseball stadium downtown. They said, this tree's got to go. And Gene said, nope, we can drop the crown down by using certain techniques. I'm not going to go into all that here because it's really involved. If you must reduce the height, reduce the height of a tree using these reduction cuts, drop crotch pruning, direction pruning versus heading cuts, things like that, hire a professional, a certified professional, because it can be done correctly. Go to isa-arbor.com. You can go to the TCIA. You can go to the TUFC. These all these places have decent information about how to do that correctly. But don't attempt to do it yourself. Okay, it's if you're going to do it on an ornamental tree. Once again, I'd say hire a professional to show you how to do that. There are many pruning guidelines for pruning smaller ornamental trees that can be um, have a caveat to them. Like I never worry about crossing rubbing limbs in a crepe myrtle, especially in the upper half of the crown, because it's really not a dangerous tree. Yeah, they cause a, it can cause a wound, but so what? I mean, I can clean up any mess it makes. It's not going to hurt anybody because they're just not big enough trees. So when it comes to ornamentals, there's a caveat to rubbing crossing limbs. But when it comes to large shade trees, it's a buyer beware market out here in the state of Tennessee. Anybody with 40 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever it takes, gets a tree, their tree care license. You don't have to prove anything of any knowledge. So as a homeowner, if you're a master gardener and a homeowner, are you gonna trust what they're gonna tell you if they're not certified? Are you gonna believe what they're selling? Or maybe they're just selling something that they want. Maybe you don't want. If you wanted to keep these trees, these silver maples, and you can see all through the neighborhood, the silver maples done. What baffles me in this picture is somebody did some pretty decent pruning on this big oak tree. So a little bit of lion telling thinning, but not bad, not the worst I've ever seen. But I wonder, is it the same tree service company? And why would they do the oak tree with better technique and then go top all the silver maples? Well, we know why. Silver maples will grow a new canopy, just like sycamores will and Bradford pears will. But here's the thing. You tell your client, I'm going to do this and it's going to regrow and it's going to damage the tree and it's going to be more costly in the years to come and see if you can sell that service. You know, you know, people who sell this service are at the very least unknowledgeable and at the very worst know what they're doing and don't care. So it's up to you as a consumer, beware. And why? Here's why. Here's your silver maple top just a couple years later. No sprouts 10, 12 feet long. They're really, you know, just sprouting right out. You know, a few more years. Now those same sprouts are now 25, 30 feet long. Anyway, 100, 200, maybe 250 pounds. And they're connected very weakly down here. Why? Because of the way it was topped, there is decay. That's what topping does. You have to understand that the middle of the tree, the center of the tree is made up of at least inactive and the most part, dead cells. They're not doing anything. They have no way to react to close the wound. So now these limbs here, as you can see where the arrows are pointed, these limbs are getting thicker and heavier. Well, they're very shallowly connected and the whole middle of that, <laughs> the whole middle of this stub here is hollow, dead cells decaying. So these heavy limbs are basically connected to a thin sheet over a dead stub. Now that is a recipe for disaster and for injury. Compartmentalization of damage in trees. I, I'm not sure if this has officially been changed. It used to be compartmentalization of dead in trees, but um, a few years ago, ISA said uh, it should be compartmentalization of damage in trees. Same thing, it's still coded. C-O-D-I-T, always look up coded online. The thing is here, this, this situation I wanted to show you is simply because this was a cherry tree in my own backyard that got blown over I cut off the top of the tree, it stood back up, and I said, I'm gonna leave and see what happens. Well, look what happened. All the cherry tree stems grew back out, but look at this big dead stuff. Well, how far down into this trunk do you think that goes? Well, this tree is hollow to the ground, and it has a hollow spot in the ground, at the ground level. So it just goes to show you, it's a big hollow tube, and it's okay for a while, it's gonna be a bushy thing for a while, but it's not a safe situation. But here's the thing, when you top things like crepe myrtles, or cherry trees on a regular basis. It's wounding, constant wounding. No tree is gonna react well to that. Constant wounding means the tree has to send a lot of resources to closing the wounds 
and it's just not gonna perform well. And when it does, it eventually just falls apart and then you take the tree out. So remember code it when pruning trees. This is not just unsightly, it's very costly. So this homeowner paid to have this tree, this tree, this tree, and this tree all hacked. Now these two here, actually this one here too, one, two, three across the front here, are, are Bradford pears. They all came back there as tall as the house again, and they're falling apart. This is an oak tree, and it's really decaying a lot. It put out a bunch of sprouts. Um, they have since topped this tree since then. So, And I have learned not to cold call on this homeowner anymore. I, I used to knock on doors and say, you shouldn't do this. It's too late. All they do is get angry. If you see this, I'm sorry, that's the, your cost. But my point here to you, if you're listening, if you're a master gardener, your neighbors are coming to you because you have that label master gardener. Tell them, don't do this. Save your money. If you're gonna prune trees, prune correctly and it will pay off in the long run. So the main things are, know at least a basic ID. I don't have to know which cultivar of magnolia this is, or even which cultivar of crepe myrtle this is. What I do know is it's a crepe myrtle, and I do know that's a magnolia. Learn at least that much. There are a lot of plant ID apps out there now. It's easy as pie. There's some free ones. There's some ones you pay for. You can get as extensive as you want. You can learn your basic ID. But here, as you can see, and this is in St. Augustine, Florida, people need to walk along the sidewalk, and they need to get in and out of this house. Well, they've elevated it so they can maintain the yard, elevated it so they can get in and out, but they're still keeping the trees. So the main thing here is, look, good pruning practices. These are, there's no stubs, there's no topping. So use good pruning practices. Fewer problems means lower cost. And once again, if you're a consumer of this service, that's important to you. But if you're selling the service as a professional, do it correctly and your clients will remain loyal to you for years and years and years, for years and years. Now, there are some pruning techniques, trimming techniques that are a little bit different. Um, this espalier technique was developed uh, from my understanding and from my reading history, it was developed in Europe when uh, the people who were working for the, the knights and the landowners were given very little property to grow fruit. They had to grow it against their buildings. Now it's done as mostly ornamental, but, but done in the, in, in, back in the historical times, they did it as a two-dimensional thing because they just didn't have room, but they needed the fruit production. So this is formal and you can see how it's been done. This tree right here, the branch goes up to here all the way out like that and then they bend it and they tie it to the framework. This one here, it comes up like this, out to that and then they bent it. Now, when did they bend this? They bent this stem when it was skinny and small like that, when it's flexible. You've got to get these in place. Now, once these have been in place for a long time, look at this tree on the left. You follow this limb up and follow that all the way up to here that's all done. They're just training it along and tying it to the stem. That's just like they, when you do a, uh, a uh, uh, like in the, the dwarf trees, the, uh, the dwarf um, bonsai trees. They use wire to make the, make the stems go the direction they want. This is the same thing. This is the kind of fun I encourage my clients to do on their property, keeps them involved with their, out, their outdoor landscape and keeps them involved with you in contact with you. How do I do this? You can see they've let this one go a little bit. I imagine it's just a lack of time to get to this. I would never let these stems get this long and there's some gaps in between, but they got plenty of time to keep that going. There are trimming and pruning techniques called pleaching. This is not bending the tree. This is pruning those side lateral limbs that go off to the side, pruning here, pruning here, pruning here, pruning here. But once it gets to the top, they leave them up here because the tree's got to have a way of making food. So all this clutter up here is all just branches to make food for the tree. But these are not bent, these are just the lateral branches. And you can see right there is a good pruning cut to show you where the direction is. Here you can see in the back, by the way, this is at that same topiary garden. Um, I wanna go back to that slide because I wanna make a point. This Buddha, sitting Buddha right here, see how his head is really thinned out? That's a hemlock and it got hit by hemlock woolly adelgid. So now there's no more sitting Buddha there. It is a ge geometrical shape now, but there's no more head to the Buddha. That's the risk you take when you do a really formal specific um, topiary shape, is that, oh, if damage happens, now I don't have a Buddha. But these people were able to make the adjustment. All right, now that's some fancy stuff. Let's just get down to basics. Here we got a pin oak tree. A low limb is hitting me in the head when I mow. I got to get the limb out of the way. If you're going to prune, prune correctly. 
This is the best management practice. Do what we call branch collar cuts. Look for the branch collar. You can see at the top, what we don't want to do is make a big giant wound right here. You can see there's your latest wound cut. This limb was taken off a few years before. You can see the callus tissue has already closed that wound and that takes place in just a matter of a few years. Why? Because the cells of the branch collar are already designed to do that. They're already in place. Mother Nature's put those cells there and said, you know what? Anything happens to this branch, that's what I'm closing it off right there. And then the tree eventually grows around it and it ends up just as a little dot on the trunk. So if you're gonna take a low limb off and you gotta get it out of your way, use the correct pruning technique. Here's a really typical situation. Here's a small red maple in a backyard. You know, when these two limbs keep growing, imagine when this piece right here is that thick and it's gonna be that thick at that level. Well, these two are gonna run out of space. All right, I'm deciding. This branch is gonna come off. It's gotta go. I've already made the decision. I'm taking the branch off. Nothing wrong with making that decision. You're not gonna kill the tree. So here we go. We're gonna take the branch off. It's really not difficult. I use my handsaw here, but chainsaw quite often the same case. The biggest reason you do an undercut first, a little bit away from the branch collar, is because if you just did a top cut, it could rip all the way down to here and make a giant wound. So you want the wound to stop right here at the branch base. So undercut first, top cut you can see to remove it. There's your finished cut at the branch collar. That's what it should look like. It's not a giant wound taking all this off. When I first learned, when I first got into arboriculture, we used to do what they called flush cuts, flush right to the trunk. That's how long ago it's, it was. Just We don't do that anymore. Now it's all branch collar cuts and you don't need wound paints. Now somebody says, well, I don't like the way that looks like a headlight in the car. Okay, well, wait about two to three weeks. That's gonna turn gray and it's gonna be cold, covered with mold. And before you know it, the callus tissue will grow and that wound will close in, in just a few years. Now the branch is out of the way. This is a little bit more advanced because this is taking a tree that has a double leader and a lot of clutter and trimming back to, and there's a bit of a, a, a visual illusion here. This branch does not curve up like that. This branch right here is actually coming towards the camera, towards the photographer. So these branches look like, okay, after pruning, they're really barren and bare, but guess what? These are lateral branches. They're subordinate to the top. The top's gonna grow much faster than these side lateral branches. The tree just does not send the same water nutrients to these guys as it does to the top. Why? Because that's where the sunlight is. That's where the cell division takes place. That's where it's gonna grow the most. So, but the problem here is the double leader. They both are gonna need space. So it's better to do that when they're fairly young. And you can see this is a fairly small tree, comparatively small, double leader. Now imagine when these two pieces are that thick. That's what you have to picture right there. Well, here I'm doing the same branch collar cut. There's my branch bark ridge close to, now we got a single leader. That's what you're gonna to do to prune a tree out for better structural integrity. Sometimes with some trees, you're gonna have tight crotches down here. There's not much you can do about that, especially things like red maples, but you do the best you can with what you got. When you're left for too long, rubbing crossing limbs, yes, especially in large trees. The biggest reason why in large trees is a big issue is because you can see right here, these limbs have been crossing. This happens to be red buds, so it's not that big a deal because red buds are fairly small trees. But you can see this tree has had to grow around this limb here and they didn't graft together. Well, that's a real weak point. So if this limb up here gets a snow load, an ice load, any kind of an extra load on it and, and bends over, that's the breaking point. That's the potential breaking point. So in a tree like this, I don't care, fine. If it breaks, I'll clean it up because nobody's gonna get hurt. It may block the driveway, it may make a mess, but the chances of somebody getting injured with that breaks off, pretty darn small. But if that's 60 feet up in a hickory tree or an oak tree, now somebody can get hurt because if it's limb like this, which is maybe arm thickness, that falling from 60 feet can definitely cause some real injury. So up high in a tree, it can be really dangerous. But you can see what happens is trees have to react to what, what they got. And if you got another limb rubbing up against you, you're gonna grow into it. Now, things like this, these are ornamental trees. This was uh, the tree of the year a few years ago for the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. It was called the Persian Parodia tree. You can see the tree on the left. It's a gorgeous tree known for its great fall color, a little bit, little bit of branching structure, but it's never gonna be a giant shade tree. This is an ornamental tree. So if it's close to a patio, you wanna see it. 
and you want to see the sculptural elements of the tree. You can see at the very base, this is what I'm looking at when I'm sitting on my patio, looking at the clutter of this tree. Here pruned out, it is a sculpture. And you can see here, look at this curved limb right there, that's still there, that's still there. This curved limb is still here, slightly different angle of the picture, but thin it out the base of the tree, make it a sculptural element. And once again, that's the view from the patio now. Now that gets a light on it. Uh, people can use that for light, lighting, um, up lighting, down lighting, any way you want to do it. That is something that is an extra ornamental feature that people actually, and this is the way I sell it to clients. You pay more to get that ornamental feature when you buy that plant at the landscape nursery, at the nursery, um, wherever you go. When you buy the Persian parodia, you're paying for that right there. That's the extra asset to it. So enhance it, bring it out. Don't, stop, don't stub it off, don't top it. That's the pruned out picture. There's the patio area. As you can see, the low limbs on this side, no problem because there's a garden over here. On this side, the limbs were taken up because people walk off the patio right there. So even you know, for people to walk safely without getting poked in the head, got to put it off to the side. How are we doing here? 49, we're good, we're good. 10 minutes, John. Yeah. So, yep. So crepe myrtle, this is, this is really common. P people put the wrong crepe myrtle in the wrong spot. This particular cultivar of crepe myrtle is called a coma. Well, look at the description and it'll tell you a thick stemmy waterfall of white flowers. Well, that sure is what that looks like. But unfortunately, right next to the house, it doesn't serve the purpose of what it's supposed to be. But if you top it, it's just gonna get worse. You prune it to thin it and elevate it. See the two little rabbit ears that were there before? They're still there. See all the little arching stems that were there? They're still there. Did you even notice the shrubs underneath there before? Nope, look at the sculptural element of this tree. There are ways to deal with the bad situations. Was this tree planted too close to the house? Yeah, probably a little bit, but it doesn't mean I have to take it down. I can utilize that tree, still get, the, to get all the ornamental features out of that tree with just the right kind of pruning. Here the issue is, well, every time I park my RV here, it scrapes the side of the RV. I cut these branches off and they just grew right back. Well, of course they did. Why? Because it's a crepe myrtle. And of course it's gonna grow back. Now you can see I did a little bit of extra thinning here, but the main thing, if you're gonna cut it, cut it all the way off. This now is up and out of the way of the RV being parked there. The client had no idea. You can see where they had topped it before and it grew right back and that was their complaint. We cut this thing back and it just grew back. Well, yeah, because you have to know it's a crate myrtle and what's gonna do. So with a crate myrtle, prune correctly and you will be a whole lot happier. These trees no longer exist. And look, these were oak trees and they were just cut year after year after year. And now all this, this commercial property had to take, pay for taking all these out and putting new plants in, high cost. These still exist and they just topped them again this year. Lots of different ways of topping still cost you more. So topping, obviously you can see I'm, I'm not for it. Um, when you have things, expensive plants like this, this is a dwarf split leaf Japanese maple. I do a lot of these because people pay for these plants. A tree like this in the nursery may cost anywhere from one to $2,000 retail price in the nursery. And they bring it home and they say, I paid a thousand dollars for this tree and it looks like a green shrub, like every other green shrub because they're not enhancing what happened. Well, they just cut it back and whacked at it and they didn't prune it correctly. And this is the issue. If you prune it thin, you start to bring out the lacy appearance and the sculptural appearance of the tree. So if you're going to prune it, this is what you allow for, the tree to get large with good structural integrity. Now that tree right there, this is on the north side of uh, Chattanooga, just on the north side of the dam. This property is a very Japanese looking house and you can see this tree is in a prominent location right in front of this house. This, this, um, tree is very virtually invaluable to this home. You know, it, it's just, but you have to be careful because it extends out here, the driveway and the, and the garage are. And if that's an issue, you know, any vehicle in there can break a branch off. So this has to be cared for correctly. So how do you do it? Well, here's what I got with that other tree just a few slides ago. This is what I was faced with when we start, first started looking at it because it just been whacked, just been topped, hacked at. Well, prune correctly, thin it out, use the structural elements of the tree, now the branching structure is part of the sculpture of this tree. You can see there's where it had been cut before. And the callus tissue is growing, reactive stems here. 
Look at all the dead cells inside this right here. There's only a little bit of live right here, but that will eventually close over that wound. You can fix a lot of damaged trees, especially Japanese maples. Doesn't matter what kind of tree it is. The technique is still the same. If I'm gonna take branches off, like along here, always take it at the branch collar. So how you prune, if you're just gonna to top, this is a fruit tree, if you're just gonna to top, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna have not just a lot of sprouts, you have dead stems. So to correct this, I go in and I try to maintain some form of taper from a thicker branch to a thinner branch to thinner branches. Always try and keep that taper. So then the following year, you'll have flowers. Now, the first time it's pruned, you may not get as many flowers, but as long as you have flowers, you could have fruit. And you can see all this is low, so it's all harvestable. Not quite as many as I'd like to see, but fruit trees, you can keep lower. You can keep them smaller if you want to. With Bradford pears, there's no getting around it. When you have this many stems originating at one place right there, you're gonna have breakage. But would you take all 18 of these out? There's 18, nine on each side of this driveway. Am I gonna remove all these? Am I gonna recommend that? I'm still not gonna to top them. No, you wait for them to break. There's the broken one, you can see it right there. Wait for them to break, you clean it up and you keep them as long as they're aesthetically pleasing for the client. So this is the important factor. Timing is important when trimming. And I, when I say trimming, I mean using hedge clippers, even by hand if you want to. But remember, hedge clipping and shearing is just trimming. It's not pruning and it's, it's indiscriminate cutting. But that's okay. Just time it correctly if that's what you want. Use boxwoods you do in the winter season. There's a few other plants like abelias that respond really well to hedge clipping. Um, do those in the wintertime because they bloom in the summer. So you've got to know your plant a little bit, especially as a professional. You should know your plant. With trees, pruning. Pruning is how you do it is far more important than when. There's a few caveats to that with a few species of trees, but keep these guidelines in, in, intact. Don't prune more than 25% of the live branches if you can possibly help it, and no more than 10 to 15% in mature trees. Any garden, even the most formal garden, will perform better with lower costs if the trimming is done at the correct timing. That's a formal garden. That's another part of the formal garden. In addition to all the other benefits, plants have a, a very positive psychological health benefits for individuals and communities. Now, as a professional, imagine this as your client's backyard. There's a lot of work to be done here to maintain it, but you can maintain this at the lowest cost. You will have a very happy client. And that is the end of the presentation. Um, Tom, if we have any time for questions, I'd be more than willing to take on any questions um, through your chat. Otherwise, I would recommend right there at the bottom of this slide, theornamenter.com has all my contact information. You can call me or text me. If you have any specific questions for me, I'll be more than glad to answer as quick as I can. John, thank you very much. That was excellent. So many things to cover. And I think if any of the arborists had just one of these properties, that's probably all they would need for a business, right? <laughs> Keep up with some of those. But yeah, we do have uh, five minutes. People could ask questions while we're while we're transferring to uh, Casey Kraus. And uh, go ahead and ask, and there's a few questions in the chat if someone would pull those out. Um, one question for you, John, here. We've got any recommendations or data on pruning roots from overgrown container plants prior to planting? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, Dr. Gilman, in his last research, has recommended that anytime you pull a tree out of a pot, if it's potted plant, you're gonna shave off an inch all the way around the root ball. Just shave off an inch all the way around. I'm a big proponent of cutting into the root ball with four uh, diagonal cuts, um, diagonal, diagonal to the, uh, the surface of the root ball pointing towards the tree trunk. Sort of like spokes in the wheel, using the tree trunk as a the hub of the wheel and you cut the spikes out. You may have to do both. Um, any yep. removal of root systems is going to stress the plant. So. Um, but what we have discovered is that you can remove quite a bit of root system. It's much better to do it as soon as you can plant it in the ground, do that, and then keep it watered and keep it irrigated and fertilized in the second or third year if necessary, and plant it a little bit high, a little bit high out of ground in our area. In East Tennessee, um, it's much more important to plant up high so the roots don't wrap around the trunk and don't put it, you know, don't mulch volcano. But don't be afraid to beat up on the root ball. 
straighten it out if you can, but cut them. Cut them if you yeah. have to. Cut them in several ways, all the way around, and that's going to be a lot better for the plant in the long run. Great, John. And one more. We've got two minutes, so we'll answer this one quick. And this kind of blew up in the chat, but if someone has topped a mature tree, what's best to be done to that tree following that initial topping? Well, if, if it's a mature, if it's a large shade tree and it's been topped down, it depends on how far down it's been topped. If it's more than one third of the tree that has been taken out, then there's probably not a whole lot of um, whole lot of leeway with that. Eventually, the decay is going to come down the trunk faster than the sprouts can close the wound, and that's going to make it a dangerous tree. It depends how many targets you have close by. But if it's less than a third of the way down, like some of our tor tornado damage ones here in East Tennessee, if it's less than a third, then hire an arborist to get in there, and they can maybe do some pruning to correct that and get it to come back. Wonderful. Well, thank you, John. So uh, up next is going to be Casey Krause with the city of Knoxville. He is our local urban forester here in Knox County. Uh, Casey is a board certified master arborist as well as a municipal specialist, and he is track qualified, which is that tree risk assessment qualification. Uh, Casey's been instrumental in planning and managing all of the trees here in the city of Knoxville. And of course, that oversees all of the maintenance of those public trees. Of course, Casey responds and mitigates potential hazard uh, tree situations, and he does that through, you know, structural pruning, pruning, and of course, removals where warranted. In addition to this, Casey also oversees compliance uh, of the tree protection ordinance here in Knox County. And all in all, Casey is a, a fellow educator and uh, becoming a good friend as I grow into this position here. So, Casey, we're glad to have you. I uh, look forward to your talk. All right, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Yes. All right, and question, do you see the uh, pointer? Yes. Awesome, we are ready to go then. <clears throat> so I appreciate it, Lee, and thanks, Tom, uh, uh, for having me here. And uh, Unfortunately, I don't get to see all the uh, folks attending today. I always look forward to this course each year and opportunity to meet everybody and catch up, but uh, here we are, and uh, hopefully next year will be another uh, story. But <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about trees suitable for the urban environment. Thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of look back at the uh, the last. It's almost been about nine years here. I've been at the city of Knoxville and look at some of the plantings, seeing what's been successful, <clears throat> what is uh, uh, some things I've learned along the way, and uh, kind of share that with all the uh, folks because as I have. Uh, stored a library full of pictures the last nine years on some of these different uh, trees and and continue to monitor things and 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 you know learn as I go. So today kind of the idea behind it is we're going to talk about uh, or identify some of the different tree species that have been successful here at Knoxville in the last decade. Um, identify some of the issues and concerns with certain tree species um, and then also talk about the importance of diversification, something that I have, uh, uh, once I got here at the city of Knoxville, I've really tried to focus in on and trying to diversify our urban tree population as much as possible. And we starting to really see that needle starting to change uh, here in the last couple of years. <clears throat> so as far as how we manage our tree population here, um, we have a uh, inventory program called Tree Keeper. It's a third party uh, ran through the uh, Davy Resource Group. Um, it's just a, a program that makes things a little bit easier on me. I can bring up to date statistics um, on the tree population. Um, I can pull up graphs, charts, and things like that to look at where we are on our diversification. So like, for example, if I'm getting ready to plan the trees that are gonna be planted in 2021, um, I'm, I can pull up those statistics and look, okay, where where am I kind of heavy on my tree population in this particular area I'm getting ready to plant? Are there some tree species that have been successful that may not necessarily be in this particular area I'm getting ready to plant? And just try and manage accordingly. Uh, the other thing I love about having the inventory program is uh, being able to track our maintenance. Uh, one of the things I did early on was put a planting year on each of the trees we planted so I can go back and look at exactly um, when these trees were put in the ground, start looking at growth rate, things like that. Um, you know, if I go back and see a tree was planted in 2012, we've got a tree that's 35 feet in height. 
and you know nine inches in diameter you know we know that that tree is being you know being somewhat successful in the urban environment and we can try and go back and replicate some of the things that may be making that tree successful uh, and then also on the planning side as well uh, great inventory program you know it may not be uh, may, may not make sense for uh, some folks, you know, on, on, on managing, um, you know, smaller grounds and things like that. But uh, if you're managing a large population of trees, uh, I, I find it very uh, convenient to be able to do a lot of different things and, and, and as far as management goes. <clears throat> so a couple of uh, um, statistics. Uh, we have about 185 different tree species. These are this is our public tree statistics. Um, we have a lot of other trees that are uh, put into that tree inventory that we have done maintenance on, uh, right of way trees, things like that, that are coming from private property that uh, are not included on these statistics, but um, inc uh, including all our public trees, those have both in our uh, trees that were planted along the streets and trees in our parks, we have 185 different species. Uh, we have about 21,000 different public trees in maintained and manicured areas. Obviously, that doesn't include the, uh, the vast uh, array of trees that we have in a lot of our nature preserves and things like that. We have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of different preserves and forested uh, parks that uh, obviously I'm not inventorying each of those individual trees. <clears throat> um, and the other thing is we've planted about 6,000 trees since, uh, since I took uh, foot here in Knoxville. So you can see a good pop good, uh, good percentage of our tree population have been planted in the last couple of years. So we have a wider range of trees at the city of Knoxville. Um, we have things all the way down to some of these uncommon trees like a dove tree, or uh, as you can see over here, you can see the uh, Alaskan yellow cedar. Um, we have different community groups and different organizations that help us uh, uh, put some of these things in the ground. So this is one of our neighborhoods, the North Hills neighborhood. They uh, actually got a um, uh, certification through the Tennessee Urban Forest Council as an arboretum. And they enjoy planting different things each year and trying out some different uh, species. Um, you know, it's onesies, twosies here and there, but uh, some things that I may not typically plant um, with my uh, typical budget. Um, and we get to try them out and see how things go. Uh, the 10 most common uh, public trees in the city of Knoxville. If you're looking at this, uh, that blue is all the other tree species. Our most popular is red maple. And if you're looking at that, we're sitting around 7.2%. Um, or about 1,700 uh, red maples in our, our uh, public tree population. You've seen a lot of different graphs and charts trying to explain, you know, you know, what's a good percentage to be at. I always just try and shoot for the, as, as, as little as possible um, and try and minimize uh, that, that percentage. Um, anything I can do to try and decrease that overall percentage of the population on a particular species, the better. As you can look through here, as you may expect, some of the more common ones, we got sugar maple, eastern red bud, hackberry, plane tree, uh, southern magnolia, so on and so forth. Now, some of these may just be existing trees like hackberry. We haven't planted, I think we've planted maybe one or two hackberries uh, in, in the last decade um, and, and definitely went a different direction on that. So those are trees that were just remnant trees, probably seeded in on their own in a park or something like that. Um, all the way up to, you know, flowering dogwood, which is our, our popular tree here in Knoxville. Um, and uh, another thing I wanted to point out on this, you can see uh, if you start to put uh, uh, species together, you can start looking at genre and looking at sugar maple and red maple, you know, two of our three most popular trees are maples. And so when I'm trying to strategize and look at diversification, you know, I need to think about those sort of things and the impacts it could be to planting more maple across the city of Knoxville. Now we still continue to plant both of those trees. Um, it's just at a lower percentage. Some of the uncommon trees found here at the city of Knoxville. Uh, here's a list of some of the things. These are individual counts. So I showed you that picture of that dove tree. Um, we have an Eastern Cottonwood sitting around somewhere. Uh, cherry bark oak, uh, Chinese stewardia, 
red elm, so on and so forth. So there are um, some unique things here um, that we have. And, and those are usually uh, uh, individual organizations or property owners that uh, uh, tend to go out there and plant something in the right of way. And, and instead of me just ripping it out and trying to cause any friction, I just, hey, let's try it out and see how it goes. <clears throat> One of the things I do is each year I go down to our nurseries in McMinnville. I, I, we have three nurseries under contract right now. Um, and it's not just me looking at uh, trying to figure out what trees are, are you know, proper, uh, you know, structure and making sure they have the right clearance. It's also me going around, driving around with those individuals that are growing the trees, building relationships, but also uh, making sure that uh, the things that I want to see are coming up and that they're growing things that I want to see. And, and I'll show you some of these uh, trees that I, I tend to utilize on, on public tree plantings across the city, but it's a good opportunity to go out there and see what's up and coming and maybe look at some new tree species that they may be growing that you might be able to utilize in the coming years. Um, gives me an opportunity to see what's coming up, go back, do some research on them, and then uh, make a decision on whether or not I'm going to try and plant a couple of these. And, and usually when trying out new trees, I do some, some research on them to see where they've grown in other areas. Um, and then also, uh, you know, looking at resources like the DERS manual for woody landscape plants and things like that to really see if they've been successful in different environments. <clears throat> so the goal, uh, you know, the goal is to find trees that can withstand the harsh urban environment, but all while doing so, trying to increase diversity. And, and the important thing about that is we want to do that, but not at a cost uh, at the community. Um, we don't want invasive species and we don't want trees that are going to be high maintenance. Uh, you know, that everything we do is a cost. And if we're having to go back and do a lot of maintenance on a particular tree species and we're over planting that, that's a cost burden to the taxpayers. And we just got to watch out for that. So I'm going to go ahead and start diving in. I uh, feel like I'm right on time here. Um, Deciduous shade trees are the first ones that we're going to be looking at, and um, we'll just kind of talk through these different tree species and, and some of the lessons we learned and things that are going on here. Now, some of these trees, I know we have a lot of folks here from Chattanooga um, area as well as East Tennessee, um, and it's important to understand that, you know, some of these recommendations, things are a lot different, believe it or not, from, from Knoxville to Chattanooga, so you may see some tree species here that... Um, you may have uh, to, to think twice about before trying to uh, put them in down, a, down in the Chattanooga area, but I'll try and point some of those things out and uh, where that may apply. So the American elm, uh, that first picture there is one of our remnant American elms uh, that we have uh, still sitting in one of our public parks, one of our larger trees. Um, still doing really well. We have several cables in that particular tree and have done an extensive amount of maintenance and maintaining it. But uh, as, as, as many folks uh, may know that, you know, Dutch elm disease has been a big issue with our, our, our American elms. And so they, we have this vast array of cultivars that have been introduced in the last couple of years, many, for many years actually, um, just becoming more and more notable in the last decade or so. Uh, one of those is the Princeton Elms, and that's one that early on I got a lot of positive reviews on, and, and it, believe it or not, it was a successful tree. You put it in the ground, you know, minimum amount of watering, and it thing just takes off almost in any type of urban environment, and, and it does really well. Well, we started having a couple of issues in the last couple of years with this particular cultivar, and, and that's what I wanted to share with you all. Uh, this is a 1922 uh, cultivar, so it's, it's been around for a very long time, so almost 100 years uh, that this, this tree has been around. Um, and it is considered D, uh, Dutch elm disease resistant. Um, that doesn't mean it can't get Dutch elm disease, uh, it just means it's somewhat resistant to it. So one of the things we, we notice is that, uh, as with all elms, they're, they're a tough tree uh, as John was talking about pruning uh, in an earlier presentation, but it's a tough tree to try and do structural pruning on. They all, they got that umbrella shape and they wanna take on as much space as possible. 
So oftentimes what happens in this particular area, you'll have multiple stems start deriving at one point. And you've got to take care of that at a, at a very young age and try and uh, eliminate that because um, that can cause structural issues down the road. So one of the things we've noticed, here's a, a uh, Princeton elm that was, I would say this tree was about 13 inches in diameter. It was planted actually in 2000, I believe it was 14. So extensive amount of growth uh, with this particular tree, but it grew so fast and, and, and unfortunately we didn't catch it at the right time, but that area I was telling you about had multiple uh, limbs growing at that one location. Uh, it actually started splitting out here all the way down to the base, as you can see here. Um, and, and we've noticed that with several of the uh, uh, American elm cultivars around the city. So uh, we're looking at, you know, trying to incorporate cables in some of these areas or try and be a little bit more aggressive on the pruning. Uh, another issue we've noticed with, um, particular with the Princeton elm, uh, is, is elm yellows. Uh, we've lost several of them in the last couple of years. Um, usually in the same geographic area, um, close to each other. Now, it's a phytoplasm disease spread by leafhoppers, and there's not much you can do with uh, elm yellows. Um, and it, they turn yellow in the middle of the growing season, and then, you know, sometimes they'll come back with a couple sprouts the next years, but eventually it's just mortality for that tree. Um, so it's another thing that I'm starting to reconsider and look at some other options on that. But also not trying to plant these things in a monoculture is also what I'm finding out. You know, maybe if we do, you know, elms and space them out in between a bunch of other trees. Um, you know, I still want American elms because they're such a great tree and, and there there's a lot of uses to them. And you know, sometimes you have a tough urban environment and condition. Uh, it's a perfect tree to stick them in there and, and see how they do. But um, oftentimes we just gotta be be cautious about. Uh, putting them too close in proximity to each other and because, you know, you get elm yellows or Dutch elm disease, it will wipe through that population. Uh, some other alternative elms, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Some of your else, uh, lace bark elms, you know, you, I've lot, seen a lot of people, Ali and Bosque um, are the uh, lace bark cultivars that are um, used quite often. Uh, one that I really liked and has been very successful is this Everclear elm. It's a lace bark variety and it's supposed to be upright. And, and, and in doing that, what, what we've realized is that there's very minimal pruning associated with it. It tends to get a nice central leader onto it. And because it wants to stay upright, you don't get those far-fetching umbrella shape uh, that you typically do. And so it's great tree to put in the close proximity in some of these downtown uh, conditions where you, where you gotta watch yourself on your spacing. Uh, frontier elm tends to be one. I mean, when I first got down here, a lot of the growers were like, I'm done. I'm going completely down to Princeton elms. And, and for whatever reason, we're back to frontier elms. Um, there, it's a cross, uh, I believe, between the smooth bark and the lace bark. Uh, don't quote me on that. But uh, it tends to have a very good uh, growth rate to it uh, and does pretty well uh, in different areas. I'm just uh, haven't done a lot of them. I'm still reading up on it and seeing how they're going to do. Uh, one concern, obviously, with any elms, as with Siberian elm, as we learn, um, you don't want those things to get away from you, and we don't want it to become a, an invasive mess down the road. So I, I tend to, you know, try out a couple, see how they go, and, and not push it too hard until we start to get some results on how, you know, what that seeding is going to look like and, and, and things like that. All right, so my next uh, tree, ginkgo tree, um, one of my favorite trees. Obviously, here's a picture from my front yard of my uh, favorite tree in my yard. And uh, uh, it's a tough urban tree. And one of the things I really like about it is it's almost almost next to no maintenance on it. Um, it grows a, it tends to grow a nice straight central leader, um, nice branching spacing as well. Obviously, a lot of us understand that you, you got to be careful um, because if, if you do plant ginkgo trees, you may get a, a female variety with the uh, nuisance fruits that tend to smell in fall time when they fall off. It's a short term issue. Um, as far as when I say short term, it's only a couple of weeks of the year, but uh, it is an issue and you will hear about it. Um, if you have a paying customer, in my case, uh, those paying customers are taxpayers and 
I just gotta be careful about where I'm putting ginkgo trees. Some of the things uh, with the ginkgo trees, uh, so because of that nuisance fruit, what we know is that they are able to um, graft male uh, um, varieties and, and, and onto a rootstock of a, of a seeded uh, ginkgo tree and promote those trees to make sure that they're not going to be the, the females with the smelly fruits. And uh, it's great. Um, but one thing I've noticed with that is uh, with those grafted males is the growth um, is not the same as what you're going to see with your straight up species. So here are two uh, ginkgo trees planted in our public tree complex, or excuse me, our public works complex uh, at the city of Knoxville. This one here is actually a male cultivar. And this one here is a straight species right here. And what I'm finding out with a lot of the male cultivars, they tend to be a little bit more wild in their growth. They don't tend to have that straight central leader. You got to prune them a little bit more and they tend to have a lot slower growth rate. And I think that has a result back to the graft. Um, it may not have a good graft on it, um, but it seems to be uh, very common with most of the, the male ginkgo uh, cultivars. Now it's not a problem as far as survivability, they still tend to do really well and they tend to survive in a lot of the different environments. But if it's a concern about, um, you know, having to go back there and, and train prune that particular tree, uh, it's something to be considered. Now this straight species, the reason that one got planted here is uh, we had, a when these trees were first planted, uh, we had one that, or actually a couple of them that died and so we went back and replaced them in, in, in the uh, individuals who put them in there, put the wrong, uh, these, these uh, straight species were supposed to go out in a park somewhere and they ended up right there in the front. Hopefully we uh, luck out, flip of a coin and we got uh, males, but if not, we'll deal with that when the time comes. And I still do plant straight ones. Typically those are environments, you know, in parks and things like that where it may not be uh, a huge issue as far as having those smelly fruits sitting around. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting tree. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I think that you got to kind of manage it based on what you may and your clients may want and be honest with them about, you know, their different options. So the Dawn Redwood, another tree species that I'm, I'm starting to plant more and more of, uh, there's several different cultivars, but then there's straight, uh, Dawn Redwoods as well. Um, and I think one of their best uh, looks are actually in wintertime uh, when you got that straight arrow head look to it. Um, and you can see the, uh, the straight central leader on that very minimal amount of pruning associated with that other than trying to do crown raises from time to time, but very minimal structural prune needed on this particular tree. Um, I'm, I'm actually starting to use this more and more as street trees. It's something that uh, wasn't readily done, uh, but I'm starting to find that there are cultivars and growers that are growing these things to have a lot of clear trunk uh, where you can get some uh, clearance right away. I've seen it up to six feet on some, uh, on some of these cultivars out there now um, where they're actually trying to grow these things for municipalities and folks like myself who, who need to have that clear trunk for you know, sight line issues and things like that. I will say that uh, they definitely favor moist, well-drained soil conditions. Um, this again, here's our public works service center. Um, and we've got a nice little case study of that. So if you look here, you can actually see the drain that comes out. This is our stormwater drain that's draining our parking lot. And all that water comes out here and drains down this particular uh, slope here. And the trees that get that water um, are, are like this, this one is about four times the size and di of diameter as the ones that aren't getting that water. And so uh, you definitely uh, see that also in the nursery blocks. If you go out to a nursery that's growing straight um, uh, Dawn Redwood, you'll see those that tend to be in a more favorable condition on the block tend to have, be larger um, and then doing a lot better as well. So just some things to think about when uh, choosing the site selection of these trees, you know, they want some moisture, but it, you know, it needs to be drained, not too much to where they're, they're constantly wet. 
And then there's also the liner considerations. Now this isn't a, a Don Redwood picture here, but um, it's the same thing. You gotta be, uh, same, the same concept applies here. Uh, you can see that this is a girdling root and that's taken place because of the container that the tree is grown in. And that's uh, what we're finding out more and more is that growers are starting to go, instead of the bare root liners, they're going to container liners. Um, they tend to have these root maker pots and things like that, that tend to make it more, um, uh, survivable once they're put into the uh, the nursery and uh, if left too long in those those liner pots and put it in the ground um, oftentimes you'll find this now this is you can see uh, up here this is the depth that this tree was at the uh, in, in the ball and burlap so that that was not readily uh, you know something that we could see uh, until we were able to actually get that thing unwrapped and, and planted um, but it is an issue. So obviously, as as we as uh, John was talking in his previous uh, um, presentation, you know, girdling girdling roots is a problem, and um, you know that's a problem that you know we'll just go ahead and prune that root off here and 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 move on. But uh, something to consider when when dealing with trees in those container liners. <clears throat> Common bald cypress. This is my next one. Um, it's one of my favorite trees and slowly moving to uh, my top top five trees that I like to plant. Um, again, I, I, I always got to keep myself in check when I start to find a tree that's very successful thinking about diversity because we don't want to overplant these particular trees just because they're successful. We want to continue to find more and more successful plants. Um, so uh, one of the cultivars that we have found to be very successful is the Shawnee Brave bald cypress. Uh, really has this nice uh, straight trunk, very similar to the uh, Dawn Redwood, has a lot of nice clear trunk associated with it. Very minimal um, uh, pruning needed with it, um, but also uh, it's very successful with this graft. Uh, here's a picture of a Shawnee Brave uh, tree. Sorry, hopefully that wasn't me giving the feedback, but um, uh, you can see the, the graft here um, where they're, they're actually grafting the stem onto the, the rootstock of a bald cypress. Um, it, 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 it tends to be quite dramatic in some cases, and, and, uh, uh, but I haven't had any issues with it so far. But what I have found out is that it's so dramatic that oftentimes the folks who are planting the tree may believe that that is actually the root crown of the tree and may actually plant it at that level. And so it's something that you need to be thinking about and making sure that you're, you're, if, you're, if your employees or yourself are out planting these trees, you know, as we know, oftentimes these trees come buried in their ball and burlap trees or in the container. And we need to find out where that root flare is when planting. And so it's just important to understand that um, on some of these cultivars that know the difference of what that graft is and what that root flare is and making sure we're getting that planted at the right depth. So sugar maple, as you saw, that this is one of our more popular tree. Um, I still like this tree, it still does great. Uh, we have tons of sugar maples in the Knoxville area. Uh, what you'll see here is that down in Chattanooga, I don't know exactly how they do down uh, there, but you're getting very close to their range down there, um, their, their, their standard range. And that's important to understand that not that sugar maples won't work. And I know they, they grow all, even all the way down to Atlanta, Georgia in certain areas. Um, but the thing I wanted to point out is, is what I've learned about the cultivars of, of sugar maple. So these are three of the more common ones you'll see out there on the market, the Fall Fiesta, the Green Mountain, and the legacy. And if you look at the zones on those, um, of, of what the um, uh, Durs book will show you is, you know, the fall fiesta, that four to seven, you know, we're in seven B here in Knoxville. So we're, we're pushing that right there at that fall fiesta, you know, the green mountain, it's a, it's a, they believe it's a hybrid with the, the black maple. And then also with the legacy, you see that at six to eight. What I'm finding now, and I've planted all three of these, in Knoxville. And what I'm finding is the Green Mountain, the legacy tend to do a little bit better, but definitely a legacy. And I think it has a lot to do with um, the fact that that has a little bit more Southern range to it. So uh, it's important to, to know these cultivars, try and know where they may have been derived from. 
oftentimes we don't know the history of them, but uh, doing a little research on them, there's a lot of information out there and there's folks who have been looking at these things for, through the years. And many of these cultivars have been around for many, many decades. And so uh, just do a little research and understanding that, uh, you know, fall fiestas, I I've lost a lot of those. And I really do believe it's because our warm uh, summers that we're having. And so I've just kind of moved away from that particular cultivar. I'm sure it's still great, probably up in the Midwest, uh, you know, Ohio, Indiana, but uh, down here in the South, I, I just try and shy away from that one. All right, the red maple. I, uh, as you know, that's the, uh, as I showed you before, the most common uh, tree we have here at the city of Knoxville. And this is the, this is the tag on every uh, red maple. This is what people are buying them from, from the box stores and from the nurseries. And they see that tag and say, wow, that's, that's the tree I want. And uh, it's oftentimes used by designers as, you know, as a way of selling their design. And, and this is oftentimes is what we see, uh, you know, these, these red maples put in a tough urban environment where they're just not being successful. Uh, we have a huge number of red maples planted in our downtown area, uh, planted probably back in the 90s. And, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to have, you know, several of these that are you know, 30 years old that have a diameter of eight to nine inches and just aren't doing very well. Uh, soil volume issue here, I'm trying to, uh, you know, continue to grow and maximize the amount of space it has there, but it's just not successful. Um, so, one of the things I, I've, I've noticed here at the city is that some of our best performing red maples tend to be those that are grown from seeds. Some of those naturally occurring ones that we find in our parks. Um, I plant a couple cultivars from time to time and, and we do put them in in certain areas, but you really need to think about uh, a couple different things when putting pretty much any of the sugar maples or red maples into the ground. So some of those considerations, uh, soil volume, that's a huge uh, consideration, making sure they have enough soil volume as that previous picture in that red maple showed you. Uh, the grafting at the nursery depth, again, that's just as we were talking about with the uh, bald cypress. The, a lot of these cultivars that we're getting from the nurseries are, are grafted. And if you think that graft is the root flare, you may be planting your, your maple tree too far on the ground. And as Tom has shown you before, if, the, if you have a tree that's planted too deep, you're going to have girdling root issues down the road, which is going to be more maintenance, more cost to you. Uh, and then the uh, origin of the cultivar, as I mentioned out before, there's hundreds and hundreds of red maple and sugar maple cultivars out there. Many of them are come from areas such as Minnesota and other places uh, from the north. And, uh, you know, the genetics and, and things like that could play a role in how successful they're going to be here in the south. London plane tree. Uh, this is a... Uh, Another very uh, successful urban tree, one that's been planted for many years. Again, one that may be getting there a little too far uh, south down there in Chattanooga. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, we still plant quite a few of them here. Uh, some of the cultivars I do, the exclamation seems to be the up and coming one. That's a cross between the sycamore and the London plane tree and the blood good uh, as well. Now, I put in there not a grower's tree and I hear that a lot from some of my uh, suppliers uh, and that really what it comes down to there's certain characteristics about certain trees that growers don't like and with that blood good it tends to have a crooked top on it it, it doesn't want to grow straight it, it 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 starts to go at a 45 degree angle and then next thing you know you've got three stems coming out of a you know four or five feet up off the ground and so there, it's just a little more maintenance on the the growers but I, I think that's one of the characteristics that folks really enjoy once you actually get it established is that, that, that overarching uh, stem direction and how it moves from one area to the next and maximizing space. And it's something that's very unique. Um, so I, I planted a couple of them if I can find them. Uh, they've been very successful. There's a little bit more maintenance associated with them. Uh, but overall, you know, trying to meet that end goal, um, I think it's going to be a successful tree. The exclamation, those things just grow like weeds, um, straight as an arrow. There's definitely a lot of sycamore in them. My, my concern um, on all of these um, is, is what, what level of resistance are they going to be to bacterial leaf scorch? And that's one of the problems we have here in Knoxville. 
Um, that's an answer that I don't get a lot of, and I don't know if there's a lot of research I've done on some of these individual cultivars. You'll see uh, them sold that way, but I don't see a lot of real life examples oftentimes. Um, so it's something I'm, 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 I'm cautious about. And again, not planting, hopefully these in, in monoculture is very similar to what I was doing with the elm, space them out and make sure that uh, we um, uh, get a good array of diversification in areas where we're planting them. And here, here's a, a picture of, of one of our bacterial leaf scorch projects. This was back from 2014, uh, planted right outside the ag campus here at UT. And just uh, bacterial leaf scorch just moved from one to the other. And we just had to wipe out this entire row of, of uh, plane trees and sycamores here. And uh, we replanted, diversified, and, and now the, the project's doing really well. But it's, it's, some, it's lesson learned. We have a lot of areas. We had a very aggressive mayor back uh, in the 90s that loved sycamores and plane trees. And it's about every, every space you see along our riverside, there's just rows of sycamores and plane trees. And it seems about every year, it's the most popular tree as far as removals go at the city of Knoxville. So sweet gum, uh, this is probably catch a lot of people by surprise, but I think there's some interesting things about it. Um, one, obviously, thing we all know is, is that these little fruits can be so much of a nuisance. I will say that, uh, you know, I, I went into a park earlier this year and, and, you know, it's a brand new park that was put in here at the city of Knoxville, like $700,000 or whatever. And my, my daughter found a couple of these, these uh, capsules here, seed capsules. And for 45 minutes, you went around collecting and playing with these and didn't even touch the playground. So I guess there is a benefit to these little uh, pods after all, but um, there's some neat things about the American sweet gum that I like. Uh, it does do really well in urban environments. It tends to be a low uh, maintenance as far as the pruning goes. Um, but the, uh, obviously the downturn is these, these seed pods and there are, uh, uh, well, before I jump into that, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention here is, is so American sweet gums, uh, as you can see, uh, the range is, is, you know, all the way from, from the Southern United States, all the way up to, to, to Indiana. And they perform differently depending on where they're at. So uh, a, gr a great example, excuse me, a great example is that is the Manitoba maple. If anybody's familiar with the Manitoba maple, anybody plant those around? Uh, what that is, is actually a box elder. And this is a picture from, from Canada. And that tree actually does really well up in the Northern climates where down here, nobody would call, be caught dead uh, trying to plant a box elder tree in somebody's yard. So uh, just lesson with the sweet gum. I think it does change depending on where you're at geographically in the United States and its growth rate and how it does. Um, so it's just something to think about. As far as the cultivars of the American sweet gum, uh, a couple of them that you've seen, uh, these, these happy days, the uh, rotunda lova been around. That's the one with these rounded leaves. Uh, I've done a couple of those. Uh, and then the, uh, the happy days is one that has a reduced amount of, of seeds associated with it. We actually put these down on Cumberland Avenue. Um, this is a picture of those sweet gums. And at the top, you can actually see um, that there is actually a couple of the seed pods, uh, seed capsules that are, are starting to develop on that. Um, and then the slender silhouettes, uh, here's these particular upright columnar sweet gum trees. They do really well, a uh, little four by four pit. Some of these are almost 40 feet in height and uh, just have been very successful in a very harsh environment. So uh, something to consider. Uh, put it in here, go seed it if you can. So, uh, you know, park or back area or something. I tend to say straight up sweet gum on a lot of areas. Um, that's something, obviously I'm not putting a straight sweet gum uh, in a high traffic area where it's, the, the, the fruits are gonna be a nuisance, but uh, if you can um, go for it. I think it's, it's, you know, again, think about diversification and things like that, it's important. There's another one hot one we're going to right now. Uh, a lot of Kentucky coffee trees being planted. Um, it's one that was not, well, I, I don't know if there are any Kentucky coffee trees that I can think of outside of the Knoxville Botanic Gardens uh, here in Knoxville, um, but 
we're, we're planning more and more of them and they've been very successful. So here's one at Victor Ash Park here at the city of Knoxville. This is one of the very first ones we planted uh, doing really well. Uh, they do get the seed pods, which I'm sure will be somewhat of an issue down the road. Um, you can get cultivars without the seed pods, um, but uh, sometimes the straight species t just tend to do really well as, as far as uh, the ones I've planted across the city. Um, here's, here's another one along the streets. So we use them as street trees as well. This tree, uh, I just went out there uh, last week and took this picture. It's about a 30 foot tall tree that's been planted from 2014. So uh, you, we planted it as a two inch caliper tree and we're getting a lot of growth. They look like sticks in wintertime, um, but they start to fill out pretty nicely as they mature. You actually can look at this tree and it does have a nice little form to it. And we're able to do quite a bit. They're kind of tough tree to structurally prune at a young age because there's not a lot to work with. Um, but we, we have been able to, to start being able to get those uh, laterals pruned back and start to develop that central leader and, and hopefully get a nice crown um, and get enough uh, space uh, between the, the, the ground and the first row of, of branches down the road. <clears throat> So Northern Catalpa, uh, that's another one I've been doing. Uh, I think a lot of folks would consider this a weed tree, but I think it does very well in urban areas and I think it has its place in Knoxville. Um, and again, uh, we don't plant a lot of them. They've got to be in the right location. And sometimes it's that location where you can't get anything else to go and, you know, cost of remediating soil may be too much. And, you know, if a, 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 a Catalpa could grow there, it might be the right tree for that spot. Uh, one thing, uh, again, this is not a, what I would people again say would not a grower's tree. Um, and the reason is, it's not so much that they're hard to maintain in the nursery. It's because the, the size that they are able to sell them at. Um, what we find out is oftentimes, you know, that, that they grow these things year one as, as their, their seedling. And within that first year, they get up to about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half in diameter. And obviously we're trying to buy things at a two inch caliper. So by year two, you go back there and they may be three and a half inches in caliper, which is a large tree and actually cost us a little bit more to move around and a little bit harder on the, uh, the growers to sell. So uh, I've got a grower that plants about a block of these for me uh, each year. And I tend to try and harvest them uh, depending on growing conditions. I'll, I'll, I'll bring them to Knoxville at an inch and a quarter and plant them in the ground. Now, uh, they tend to do really well and tend to be successful. And uh, I, I don't mind uh, uh, buying a smaller tree just because I know the growth rate's gonna be there. <clears throat> Let me get into some of our oaks. Um, yeah, move this along a little bit. Uh, willow oaks, uh, obviously those are one of our tough urban trees that we've been playing for years. Here's a picture from Chattanooga. You know, where are these trees growing? Obviously, they probably reached outside of those planters in some, some, some degree. Um, you see this all over, all the way from Charlottesville, Virginia, where willow oaks just, you know, they, if they find space and they find the right conditions, they'll go. Um, one thing that we've had issues with here at the city of Knoxville is pH issues. So you got to really be careful. Um, you know, obviously, uh, here uh, is not the best uh area to be putting a, a, a willow oak, obviously with a bunch of lime that was thrown in here from concrete spoil. So uh, we, we tend to, to plant willow oaks in areas where we know the pH is gonna be a little bit lower and we're not gonna have that, that issue as far as chlorosis goes and, and iron deficiencies. The other issue we've noticed too, uh, we've lost two different years, we've lost, um, our entire crop of, of willow oaks. We plant typically in winter time. And what happened was uh, they were sitting out at the holding yard at the uh, nursery we bought them from and it got freezing temperatures and, and they were the only tree that suffered from it. So you really got to protect that, those root balls on those trees. Um, I, twice that's happened where we had to get reimbursed from the nursery um, on, on trees and got, had to get them replaced. So it's just something to be, uh, Think, thinking of if you're you're buying large amounts of uh, willow oaks. Sawtooth oaks. So this is our famous uh, Market Square grove of sawtooth oaks. These trees were, they're about uh, 50 years old. Um, 
And our, our maintenance folks down there absolutely hate them because of the vast crop of, of acorns they produce. Um, but they're very, the reason I bring this picture up, they're very hardy. So we actually, each year we're going in and we were sodding this, this little square of, of grass and putting more and more soil up on the, uh, the base of these trees. And in, stop, in order to stop doing that, what we came up to was let's put a permeable path through the middle of this. And, and a lot of people are like, I can't believe you're going to build a path right through the root zone of all those trees. Well, we went in there and root pruned down where the path was going. And believe it or not, uh, I only came across maybe two or three roots that were uh, over an inch in that entire uh, depth that we went down to about eight inches. Those roots were, were deep uh, and, and, and they were able to withstand uh, the, the disturbance uh, of this, this sod through the years. And, and, and really, they've really responded well and they're doing well downtown. Um, it's a really... I, been successful project on our end. Here's a peppermint grove that was put in this Christmas of these in of these uh, sawtooth oaks, and you can see that they're about as close to a live oak as you're going to get here uh, in Tennessee, with their their large scaffold branches, and they tend to have really round crown as well. Uh, again, this is the same issue as with the catalpa, not a grower's tree. They tend to grow really quick in the nurseries. So here's a picture. This right here is a little seedling I put in my old house. Now this whole subdivision was, it, it's pretty much just shell and clay. Uh, it's got about an inch of topsoil and then you're down the red clay, heavily compacted. Um, this was planted in 2014. I went back there. Uh, I, I was hoping to find a picture. I did not get, get a picture of it when I revisited, but that tree is almost 22 feet in height right now. And I planted that tree as a seedling. So, uh, you know, it, it does really well, uh, horrible soil conditions, and, and it tends to be pretty successful. Uh, bur oak and swamp white oak, these are a couple that I brought down from the north uh, as far as to trying to plant. I don't think the either of these were planted in Knoxville, and I don't know if they would be successful in the Chattanooga area or not. Um, I will say that I found bur oak uh, at the Norris Dam here in Tennessee. Uh, they were planted about 70 years ago. They were about 35 inches in diameter, and they look great. So I know they can grow here. Um, I just don't think they were widely used. Um, this is the, uh, the swamp white oak with the flaky bark and the bur oak with the corky branches. Um, very similar as far as their success. Here they are growing next to each other. Here's the bur oak. Nice central leader, easy to prune into a straight central lead as well. Uh, and here's the uh, um, swamp white oak that tend to retain their leaves in wintertime, maybe somewhat of a, a negative for some folks, but uh, very similar in their characteristics and tend to grow in, uh, very well in urban, uh, urban areas. We're, we're seeing some of these trees that were planted seven, eight years ago that are, are 20, 25 feet in height right now. Again, some minor considerations on this. We find, especially with a lot of the oaks that are grown in these um, root maker pots, you just gotta be careful. Um, if the nursery doesn't fix those girdling roots when they replant them from the liners, you may have girdling roots on there and uh, just something that uh, needs to be considered when planting them. <clears throat> Overcup oak, very similar to the bur oak and white oaks, another one we've been planting quite readily. Um, it does have some chlorosis issues uh, if planted in areas with high pH. Um, so it's just something to be considered uh, as well. And then pin oak. So this is one that I'm kind of turning away and why I'm looking at some of these alternatives. And the reason is again, uh, as with our sycamores and, and London plane trees is bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, here at Lakeshore Park, um, we were heavily planted with pin oaks. And I think it's about every year we're going out there removing 25, 30 of these pin oaks uh, across the park. Um, as, as bacterial leaf scorch moves through. All right, small and medium-sized tree. We'll get to as many of these as possible. I've got about uh, five, six minutes, it looks like. Uh, yellow wood's another one I'm going to. One of the things I will mention about yellow wood, um, a lot of your suppliers and growers may assume that this is a multi-stem tree. Um, we have uh, been able to acquire these things as central trunks up to almost a seven foot height in some cases. Um, and in those that we didn't, we were able to turn them into a central trunk tree. So here's a, a, a very aggressive pruning project that we did recently on a, uh, a street tree planting of yellow woods. 
and uh, they do really well. Um, haven't had much issues, but uh, you can grow them as multi-stem trees, as you can see in this picture before above. Um, they have that vase shape, very similar to an elm, and they tend to do really well in, in the Knoxville area. Uh, Japanese Zelkova, there's a couple different cultivars of these. Uh, this is a tree species I've started kind of moving away from. Um, and, and the reason is they're very hard tree to prune uh, and trying to get some form to. They tend to have low arching branches and multiple stems deriving at one place. There's different cultivars, green vase and green village tend to be the most popular. Uh, and what we did find out though, is that uh, during the 2016 drought, uh, did a big number on a lot of our Zelkova trees. We lost a ton of them. So uh, they, it's funny, you, you don't have to water much as during establishment, they'll take off. But uh, once they're established, they're not very talented to drought. And we, we lost, uh, this is a Middlebrook Pike and we lost almost about every single one of these uh, Zelkova trees that uh, were, were planted out there several years ago. <clears throat> Another important thing, this goes for elms and Zelkovas with the uh, depth. I don't know what it is, but they tend to be planted really deep at the nurseries oftentimes. And um, you gotta make sure you know, find that root flare uh, so when uncovering these things from the ball and burlap, this is a, an inspection that was not passed, obviously. And this is, this is not a, uh, a uh, Zelkova tree, but it gives you an example. This one was planted too deep. The root flare is well on the ground. You just got to make sure you know where that root flare is because I'm finding out uh, with nurseries and suppliers is that they are sometimes six to eight inches in the ball. Um, I try and capture that stuff before I, I, I I buy them, that's why I'm tagging trees, but sometimes, uh, you know, things can fall through and, and I just wanna warn a lot of folks out there, uh, if you're planting these trees to be careful of that. Trident maple, another great urban tree that we've been using, um, <clears throat> take, does really well in these reduced soil volumes. Uh, flowering dogwood, uh, one of the things I wanted to point out with flowering dogwood, uh, we, we people tend to be the number one issue with these guys, uh, the mulching, the planting practices, just like I was talking about with the elm trees, the planting depth on these things are oftentimes deep in the root ball. The mulching is, is they, they, of all trees, we had a horrible mulching practice going, pra process going on here at the city of Knoxville for many years. A lot of that's been eliminated, but, um, this was one tree that did not do well with that excess mulch around the base. So if you're out there mulching them and, and, and you got a bunch of mulch around the base, you, you're, you're able to set in that decay uh, around the trunk of the tree where it just doesn't take very much of growing season or two and it can girdle uh, the, the, the uh, um, phloem and, and really end up killing that tree. <clears throat> Shade tolerance is another thing to be thankful thinking of. Obviously, they grow in full sun, but uh, you just got to be careful about some of the diseases that may be prone to those trees under stress in full sunlight. Uh, Chinese pistache. It looks like we got, I got nine minutes here. Um, a Chinese pistache, uh, multiple uh, 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 branches deriving at the same location is a concern. Uh, great fall color to this tree but it's very tough tree to try and get into a straight central lead. Um, it's a small to medium sized tree. I've been aggressively pruning these things and we have started to have some success on, on getting these things into a central lead. Uh, I'm learning a lot as I move through uh, so much that I feel like I could probably fill in 30, 40 minutes on how to prune Chinese pistache trees. But uh, it's a tree that structural pruning is a very, very big challenge. Um, you can, and, and obviously these, these low hanging limbs here is something that's a concern to me because obviously if they mature at that point, they get bigger and bigger, you know, they're in the way of box trucks, pedestrians, things like that. And, and you don't want to be pruning these things off when they're, you know, nine, 10 inches in diameter. So trying to fix that issue at a young age, but that's one thing they grow very well here. They do, they're very successful. Um, and, 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 and I haven't had any issues with them so far. I've seen a couple down in Chattanooga. Uh, I, didn't, I couldn't find my pictures of them. I know I took some pictures of them. Uh, probably some that Gene planted back in the day. 
Um, and they, they, they looked like they were really well. They're some of the larger Chinese pistachio trees I've seen growing um, in an urban setting and, and they tend to be uh, doing really well. Um, uh, Pete, Pete may have another story about those. I don't know. Uh, Sweet Bay Magnolia, uh, another great one. The, one. the ones I've been going into are these Moonglow and Australis cultivars and the central lead is what I like about them. Uh, one thing about uh, Sweet Bay Magnolias is they are, they're resistant to caterpillar. Uh, that's a uh, tough joke right there for you guys who see this uh, large caterpillar truck uh, sitting there and not uh, in the way, but uh, you can see that they are, they are very resist, uh, resilient in their urban environment. Um, they do really well, they're semi evergreen and I, I like these cultivars because of their straight central lead and this moon glow cultivar, I've been finding that uh, it actually can get, I can get uh, 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 clear trunk up to almost a six to seven foot height on, on, a, on a two, two and a half inch caliper tree. So um, I've got two minutes, I wanna open it up. I'm gonna stop at 1055 here. Uh, Eastern red bud. Very colorful tree. There's so many cultivars out there. Um, some of them I've explored with. The ones I'm having the most success with right now is the forest pansies. I, I don't know what it is, but they just do really well in some of our medians and, and restricted growing spaces. Um, some of these other cultivars um, have been a little bit more work, especially trying to get them into a central lead or get them out of the way. Um, they're a small growing tree. They're Obviously they don't wanna be uh, you know, pruned up to a height of 10 foot clear trunk. But uh, um, there's other issues with some of these cultivars, like with the, the hearts of gold, a lot of folks think that they're, they're, you know, got some kind of nutrient problem when yellow is just the color they are at the new growth. So uh, common crepe myrtle, another one we've done a lot of, obviously, uh, John did a great uh, explanation. One of the things we don't like about them is, is obviously the mistreatment that we oftentimes see with them. So uh, with that, I am going to call it a day, and uh, if you guys had any questions, or I can go back through and read the uh, whatever works best for you, Tom. And Thank you very much. Um, I did jot down a couple questions that were on the chat. First question was, um, someone asked about Black Gum Tupelo Tower cultivar, I guess. Do you, are you familiar with that one, or? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that cultivar. Uh, one of the uh, trees that we have been planting quite often is Tupelo and the, several different cultivars out there. Um, and they, they've been successful. The one thing is just a growth rate. They tend to want to get a very bushy bottom to them before they get a central lead. And so it's just been somewhat of a challenge on pruning, but uh, been, been very successful. We've, we've probably put 100, 150 of those things in in the last couple of years, so. The other question was weed control, probably not. They asked about around dogwoods, but I would guess weed control around many trees. Do you do any uh, chemical weed control or other methods? Yeah, um, the uh, as you may have seen in some of the plantings, it depends on where they're at. We try in our parks, try and establish a mulch ring. Um, resources oftentimes is challenging, but our, our horticulture department does go back through and does use different uh, chemical applications from time to time, just trying to keep the grass and weeds at bay. And then try, what I do is, is I reestablish that root uh, ring every couple of years. So uh, I think it's on a, I, I think I do it on a three and a seven year cycle uh, is, is going back in there, uh, making sure we try and push uh, any of the uh, weeds at bay away from there and checking the tree again for uh, girdling roots. So. Hey, Casey. Yes. Um, one of the things that uh, this nailed in, one of the things that we've been seeing, uh, particularly on dogwoods, but other species, is not only too deep a mulch, but soil running back against that root flare and causing some rot. Have you noticed that? And what do you do to try to stop that, particularly planted on slopes? Yeah, uh, I, I have noticed that, Neil. Um, it's, it's unbelievable how fast that can change the health of the, the dogwood trees, too. Um, I'm finding they, the dogwood trees just do not like that excess uh, substance up and around the base of the tree. Planting them high is where I've been 
trying to do is, is just try and get them as high as possible without getting them too high. Um, really discovering where that root flare is and, and being a little bit more uh, stringent on the inspections on those things. So when I go back and inspect my uh, installers, um, I, I'm not passing anything where I'm not able to see a root flare by driving by it. So. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Lee, did you have something to ask or yeah, not? Yeah, no. Great, Casey, great job. Thank you so much. That was really great. Pete Stewart has been in Chattanooga a very short time. Pete is the city forester in Chattanooga's Department of Public Works. He's worked as a commercial arborist for more than 10 years. He's got his master's in forestry from Virginia Tech, a very great school up there, and has a strong interest in the southeastern flora and in managing city trees as part of his urban ecosystems. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lucy Ellis as well. Lucy is also in the city of Chattanooga, but she's in the water quality program. She studied environmental biology at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. She worked with plants and wildlife at three national parks and other public lands. Lucy works for the city of Chattanooga, maintaining the green infrastructure and increasing the biodiversity of urban areas. So I wanna welcome Pete and Lucy to our program. Take it away, yep. Okay. So I'm, I'll probably cover the first 15 minutes of it and then Lucy will take over the bulk of it and then we'll do questions at the end. Great. Uh, so yeah, I've been in this role as city forester for about a year, taken over for Gene, Gene Hyde, I'm sure many of you know. He was the Chattanooga's first city forester and he retired end of January last year after 30 years. So there's a lot I'm still learning about the field and the position, but I've been um, really lucky to be part of this project. This project was part of a group called the Land Managers Working Group, uh, which is cross-departmental, um, where we're looking for ways to collaborate on environmental issues. Uh, in particular, this project was all inside of the Land Managers Working Group is across most city departments, but this project specifically is inside of public works. So it involved people in parks, uh, myself, forestry is one of the departments of citywide services and uh, Lucy's in water quality, which is part of engineering. So this was, it, this was not organized by our uh, bosses. This was a project we, we have created um, on our own as part of this working group. Um, so I'll, I'm going to go through some of the background on the reason for the project and a little bit about the urban forest, urban forest in Chattanooga. A lot of the numbers I have are from Gene's, Gene commissioned several studies in the late 2000s. We've got tree inventory data from then. We've got tree cover data and um, the statistical sample of trees also. Um, a lot of the data I have is about 12 years old. But this is the land cover classification from 2008, and it found 51% tree cover citywide, which is pretty high, but you can see a lot of it has to do with wooded areas on the edge of town. This is the, um, out on the Eastern side is what's now the nature park, former um, arsenal site. And then on the Western edge, these are slopes of the mountains. Um, the tree cover downtown was about 13%, and that is something that's fairly low. That's something that an uh, initiative called Take Root um, was trying to address in the early to late 2000s, early 2010s. With the help of a uh, big grant, they were trying to increase tree cover downtown. The goal was 15% downtown tree cover, and they planned to, this was Gene along with um, Preston Roberts and others, planted over 1,400 trees just in the business district downtown. That you can see, that's where downtown is. These are some of the numbers from, um, this is the iTree Street Study, it's called, that's part of iTree Eco now, but it's a statistical sample of the street tree population of Chattanooga. So they didn't, they didn't measure every single tree, but they took what was a representative sample and uh, estimated the whole population from there. So they found that out of about 166,000 trees, there were 102 tree species. These are the five most common, and this is citywide on 
city managed trees. So mostly right away trees and parks. Hackberry is most common, dogwood, the black cherry, mimosa, and crepe myrtle. And one of the rules of thumb when we're looking at urban forest diversity is that you ideally, and this is a fairly low threshold or easy to meet threshold, you wouldn't want any one species to um, be any more than 10%, any one genus more than 20, any one family more than 30%. Uh, so citywide, um, we're close to that standard. Crick Myrtle, is a, sorry, Hackberry was a little over. Downtown, these are the numbers for the downtown area. Um, and we, as uh, Casey was talking about, we have, especially in the downtown area, we have a lack of tree species diversity. And that's typical in most cities' downtown areas, um, but it definitely create, can create problems with pests. The Craig Myrtle is the most common, followed by Willow Oak, Blaze Park Elm, or Chinese Elm, Ginkgo, and Golden Rain Tree. So these are the, the general diversity rules of thumb. No, there's no true scientific basis for them, but there's it's something that is it's held to people try to meet in uh, urban forestry planning. These numbers often get cut in half, um, yeah, depending on who's doing the analysis. Um, but those those were drawn from a wider downtown area. What's in purple on this map? When we're looking at just the downtown business core, shown in over here, uh, willow oaks make up 24% of those trees, which is a and that's not even just oaks. Oaks would probably make up over 30. We count overcup and scarlet oak and a few others, but willow oaks make up about a quarter of all the trees in the downtown business district. So that's the back, that's the real background for this. These are high value trees though. Earlier on in the 90s and into the 2000s, Gene started replacing the calorie pears that line, line Broad Street with willow oaks. And these were Ascendor and um, I'm afraid any other cultivar, but these were um, high dollar willow oaks from a from a top of the line nursery, planted with, um, they, they took a lot of extra measures to increase the soil volume. So each of these plantings probably represented uh, $1,500 $1, or more per tree. They spent a lot of money and the result is great. This is Broad Street downtown. Um, Riverfront Parkway is also lined with willows. Um, these are the trees. There's been some issues with chlorosis, but for the most part, the trees are in good shape. Uh, the form is great and they're growing well and it, it looks great. Um, the problem is there's just so many of them. So what happened in 2018 was uh, an outbreak of scale, probably Oak Canyon scale. This is a newspaper article at the time talking about um, in their interview gene. This is before they treated trees, but they were looking at chemical treatment. Um, because we're looking at a quarter of downtown trees were infested, heavily infested with scale. And it was starting to, um, you could see the difference in the foliage. What, what scale pests can do, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, it's not going to kill a tree overnight, but you're going to deal with um, cosmetic issues and nuisance problems from honeydew and sooty mold. And then over the long term, you're going to see chlorosis die back, reduce vitality, and uh, eventually decline in death if, it, if the population, insect population, is sustained for a few years. So this was in the in the, maybe this did begin in 2017. I wasn't on the job at this time. I was out of town. Um, 2018, the trees were actually treated. Some of the options for treatment. Um, these are armored scale. Makes it a little harder to treat with if you were trying to treat with a contact insecticide. The crawler stage of the insect is vulnerable to contact insecticides, but it's not really practical to do a foliar treatment, uh, or it's difficult to treat downtown trees, medium-sized downtown trees, with a foliar treatment. So if we're going to use chemicals, systemic treatment is really the only feasible option. And as you know, most of those are neonics, which come with their own downsides. So in 2018, the city contracted out this work. 
over 500 trees were treated with, uh, I think with a basal spray, donateferin. And it works, it worked fairly well. In the years since then, we still see the canium scale on some willow oaks in the downtown areas, but not in, uh, these, these trees were covered. Uh, all of these trees, the, the twigs and a lot of the branches were, were covered in scale. Um, so we just see smaller pockets of scale since then. So that treatment, it was successful, um, but it was a huge amount of neonic being applied in the downtown area. So we wanted to look at alternatives if there were to be another outbreak of scale in downtown um, alternatives. Uh, we're talking aside from tree diversity, which is the um, long-term solution to this problem. But in the short term, what are other things we can do to uh, reduce the impact of a scale outbreak like this? And it was Gene had, Gene had started looking into biocontrol options, biocontrol meaning introducing natural enemies of the pest. Um, and he was contacted by a um, Atlanta company who proposed biocontrol release. They do that on a smaller scale, I think in residential yards. These are the species they were proposing. And we considered this, this was, it would have been an experiment, an interesting experiment for, I believe they had not done a release on this scale. And um, I don't know that there's much, much research on fire control in on a large scale in urban areas. So we were considering this option, but I think because it was costly and experimental, also of these four insects, I, I'm not an entomologist, but I believe the lacewing might be the only one that is from this region and could overwinter here, meaning they don't have to be replenished every year. Um, we decided not to go with that option. Instead, we focus on creating habitat for native natural enemies of scale. So we looked at sites that were close to oak plantings downtown, were irrigated and easily maintained. And we came up with two sites. The first of these, this is um, just the near south side of downtown, if you're familiar with Chattanooga. This is the TVA buildings here, convention center. This is the main terrain art park. It's this narrow block long park. And we created two planting sites here and then a third one or second location, um, maybe about a mile away at a neighborhood park. So that's that's the intro, I think. I'm passing it off to, Lynn, to Lucy at this point. Okay. So um, when we were looking at doing this understory garden project, uh, I did a lot of research on the integrated pest management part of the, the project. Um, so just the concept that native plants are part of IPM um, and using that as the strategy um, you know, one part of the strategy that uses multiple methods uh, based on the life history of the pest and to reduce damage and issues caused by the pest. Um, the great thing about IPM is that it promotes human and environmental health. And um, sometimes the cost and time invested in IPM is greater, um, but this is reduced over time as the system stabilizes because um, the, the idea is that we're, we're contributing to a system that will self-stabilize and then we won't have to put as many inputs in ourselves. We'll just be managing and monitoring the system. Um, so using native plants for urban IPM is not well studied or used yet, but it borrows a lot of principles from agriculture which have been studied and are becoming more important as farm production transitions back to smaller farms out of sheer necessity for our crop production. Um, so planting some rows with native or other wildlife supporting plants helps increase crop yield while reducing herbicide use and non-target plant and insect damage. Um, comparing these methods that use a lot of pesticides and herbicides to IPM the benefits are increased pollination of crops while providing food and habitat for the predators of the pest insect, uh, which yields in better crops. 
uh, reliance on herbicide alone reduces the pest, but without these other benefits and with greater risk to human and environmental health. So we were unsure how much garden space is required to accomplish our goal, because again, there's not a lot of research on this application, um, but we had to start somewhere. So now we have about 700 square feet of native plant garden, and that's split up um, about 500 as is that main terrain and about 200 is at Jefferson Park. So we were looking at um, a lot of different species. Again, we want this to be like a really diverse ecosystem that can self-manage. So if one species doesn't survive, it has all of these other species that it can rely on and, and bounce back from, from any negative consequences. Uh, so we designed these for to be uh, Tennessee native plants that were available at plant nurseries. Um, the flower shape that these plants have needed to be flat and open for these little um, wasp faces to be able to drink nectar from. You know, this is an urban environment, so we wanted plants that were adapted for full sun or part shade. And we have a lot of clay and basic soils, rocky soils, um, shallow soils. So we had to choose plants that could withstand those kinds of pressures. And Tennessee native plants do all of those things. Um, so looking at the species list, you'll notice that there are three species of Echinacea, two species of Monardas, two Tratus cantias, two Rudbeckias. Why did we bother to have multiple species in the same genus when we're looking at diversity? Well, this is part of biodiversity um, at its core is being able to have, having lots of different species in the same genus is actually beneficial to us because we want bloom time to overlap. And this is another way that we can test native species in an urban landscape is put these species side by side and then be able to choose which ones do the best. Uh, so this is kind of, this is some loose science um, you know, no one's studying this in, in depth. This is just for our own knowledge. As we expand the program, we can tweak things. And that's an important part about this pilot is being able to learn from, from our mistakes and learn a lot from what the garden teaches us. So some of these species were dependent on nursery availability. Uh, as a botanist, it was important that I chose species that were actually grown very close to Chattanooga so we used uh, reflection writing and uh, overhill nursery for a lot of the bulk of the flowering species and uh, then Hoffman nursery, which is in North Carolina uh, for a lot of the grasses that we put in the garden. What we have a uh, picture on the left is Lacanium scale at Jefferson Park on a willow oak. So you can see the like kind of white crusty stuff. Those are probably young hatchlings of Lacanium scale. Uh, that burst out when uh, my coworker popped these open. And then on the right, this is what we want to see, right? We want to see lots of baby wasps popping out of these shells instead of, instead of the white egg masses. Um, something about Jefferson Park, um, the oaks there have plenty of soil volume. There's a lot less pavement right around the, the root zone but it still, it still gets pretty hot out there. And the urban heat island effect has been associated with increases in scale infestations um, of gloomy scale on maples, uh, which is another very popular urban uh, street tree and it's often planted in parking lots. So if, if you can imagine uh, gloomy scale overtaking a maple by a parking lot, this lacanium scale would, would also increase with the street tree pressures of, of all of our willow oaks downtown. So we should strive to make a uh, habitat for parasitoids in all landscaping where there are combined stresses to trees. These wasps are not dangerous to people. Uh, they don't sting and they are so small it is likely they've landed on you and you've never even noticed it. And they're no bigger than like uh, a piece of short grain rice to give you some scale. And I want you to notice how flat that little wasp's face is. So if you've ever seen a bee, they have like those long tongues that can go down into longer flowers. 
these just are not the same. Um, they need something like a flower that's very open um, with shallow nectaries. And that is why we chose uh, so many of our species it was based on the structure of the flower. Um, Understory Garden's goal is building habitat for the wasps to protect trees and people. Uh, look at how these tiny flowers in the Solidago speciosa for the showy goldenrod and then the, the Achillea millifolium on the right. Um, they're like a little cafe table for these wasps. Like just imagine him sitting at a little cafe, having a drink of nectar, eating some pollen. These are the images I love to show people because it really illustrates how this co-evolution has done this beautiful dance over time and this wasp has found the perfect spot for it to eat and the, the plant has responded in encouraging this to happen by producing smaller petals, smaller flowers, combining lots of flowers together. That's something that um, is very, very beneficial to, to having these diverse interactions. So yeah, I mentioned like larger insects like bees have long tongues that can reach down into tubes. And a lot of the research shows that plants in the mint, carrot and aster families have an abundance of species with numerous shallow flowers. And uh, that's why we chose so many species in these families, the mint, aster and carrot families. This is like fast food for them. So this was a planting matrix that our LA designed for us. This is modeled after kind of a meadow style planting and we wanted it to have lots of color and texture throughout the year. These are gonna be in very public places. So we needed it to be somewhat acceptable to people while also getting the, the insects what they need, which is bloom time throughout the year. And they also need um, a good amount of cover. So we added a lot of grasses that you know don't have showy flowers but are very important um, especially during the winter months because the hollow tubes of grass stems uh, provide places for uh, insects to to hide their children in and uh, they get to and they can hide from predators as well we when we ran out of a species like when we used when we used up all of one species of grass the, um, going back to this matrix made it very, very easy to make changes. And one of the things that was so beneficial about using a matrix style planting like this is that um, while we didn't always have like a planting that was specifically for the site, we could actually take this, we could take a row out, we could add a row, we could repeat rows, we could flip rows around. And so you have this flexibility when you're using a matrix style planting. Uh, it's just something that I really found really user friendly about about it was just being able to to substitute very easily on the fly when we were building the gardens. So when we actually got down and started building these gardens, we were sharing resources uh, between parks and forestry and all of the planning and research that we had put in was finally uh, starting to to have visible effects in the landscape. One of the things that water quality does a lot of research in is sustainable landscaping. And um, we had uh, a lot of time to, to learn things, but we were also learning as we went. This being a pilot project, learning as we went was acceptable and being able to collaborate internally um, on, a, on our own terms was important to us which is why we didn't have a whole lot of contractor help. Uh, we did have uh, someone come and rip out the sod here for us because we didn't have that particular piece of equipment. And it's very labor intensive to do it on your own by hand. So being able to evaluate the situation and change based on what was happening is a sustainable landscaping practice. And that is a collection of practices that, that we use in the landscape, we're always learning from what we've seen the previous season, watching how things change throughout the season. And this is a really good example of sheet mulching. 
Uh, this is a way to deter weeds when you're establishing a new garden. Uh, Cause we were planting this in some pretty well fertilized turf. So this is at main terrain and it's a very heavily used park, very visible. So there's a lot of fertilizer used on this grass to keep it really, really green. And um, there's a lot of Bermuda grass. There's a lot of fescue, you know, your normal kind of turf grass area. And those are very aggressive species, especially the Bermuda grass. Um, if you've ever tried to make a garden where there was once lawn, you will find it very difficult to keep the grass roots out. So um, that's why we're using the sheet mulch technique. And, and it was very, very helpful. It helped give us some time after we were done planting to, uh, to wait and see how well it worked. Um, and so we did learn from this. And uh, I do want to to point out that we were going to use volunteers to help plant and help help with this process but because of covid we were not able to use volunteers so we had staff um, sign up and uh, and we were able to space out very safely to to complete this project so when we were doing the first garden at main train um, we had a lot of our flowering perennials from our local nurseries we actually were able to go and pick them up ourselves, which is really great to have a um, like a face-to-face -face interaction with your growers because um, they picked out the healthiest plants for us. I didn't have to do that. And that was really a time saver. We had to wait to get our warm season grasses in because those take a little longer to grow. And this was April when we started this project. Uh, so the pink flags here just showing marking where we're going to put those grasses when we do get that shipment in. But again, we were able to, to do this with staff and we spaced out safely. I always kind of stop and think about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And this is a tree at Jefferson Park. This is a, a very large willow oak. And I, I always think about how much water is being stored in the tree, how much water is going to be uh, transpired and filtered over the course of its lifetime. Um, it gets better at what it does the longer it's alive. Preserving future trees is uh, a big interest for the water quality program. We don't want to keep planting small trees, replacing them with even smaller caliber trees. Uh, we want the trees that we have now in the landscape to grow to be really big, just as big as this one. And uh, this is actually one of the largest trees in the neighborhood. I want to point out that it's a uh, it's a member of the community. Uh, Jefferson Heights is uh, is not tree dominated. This is, you know, what I, I said. It was one of the largest trees. There's one other tree, and uh, people that live in this in neighborhood uh, call them sister trees because they're about the same age. They're about the same height. When you look over the landscape, you can see this tree and the other one. Uh, but those are the largest trees. When I think about how close this tree is to the playground. I think about how many times, uh, you know, hot, sweaty kids have come and, and rested in the shade here. How many times people have have gotten under this tree uh, like I am in this picture when it was raining for for a little bit of uh, respite from the rain and just how intimate uh, a relationship between a tree and its and its neighbors can be. And this is kind of the, the same bond that we're trying to foster with these understory gardens is give these trees some friendly neighbors, some good plants that are gonna help protect it long-term and uh, provide those, those ecosystem services that the parasitoid wasps and other insects are gonna provide. Oh, so this is Jefferson Heights Park. This is right before we started to uh, plant. And we picked this site because it was right next to a water source uh, where I took this picture, it was just to my right. You can see these community gardens over here. So there's already a water source, even though these aren't irrigated, it's very easy to get out and hand water it. And we were making a smaller garden here anyways. So this is a really uh, tight knit neighborhood. Um, all these kids play together. Uh, they walk through here every day. And that was something 
important to us is to really showcase these plants, get people used to seeing natives in the landscape. It'll also, the, the species here will help support the ones that are in the garden over here. So people's tomatoes and cucumbers, those are gonna also benefit from having a few extra parasitoid wasps flying around, keeping the pests in check. We also wanted to make sure that this was easily accessible by people that were gonna maintain it. Uh, we didn't wanna make an asset that was difficult to maintain or took extra steps from our staff, like having to get the water truck and fill it with water and drive it out here and you know park on the grass and have to water it that way. Um, those are all kind of site selection tips that, that we've learned and, and uh, we, out, we also, during this project, we found that a lot of our landscapes had broken irrigation. And so that was a highlight for us that uh, we actually need to invest in irrigation if we want gardens. And even though these are hardy plants that we're putting in, they do need um, water to establish at least the first year or two. So this is what the garden looked like in November. The last thing we did was just put this little fence around it to keep uh, the stray soccer balls out and also the grass clippings. The contractor that mows has been blowing the grass clippings right into our garden and the, the neighborhood's gardens too. Um, so Bermuda grass is all over the place, uh, but we're taking steps to minimize that. Uh, we purposely kept the front of this garden open because we want people to take a step in and be able to see the flowers, see the insects and they're working and uh, just get a little closer because we want this to be uh, a very open example about what we're doing. And uh, we left the, uh, the tags on the plant so people can read what they are. So thrilled that, that we got this project done the way we did. So this is looking at the soil we were working with. We uh, scraped off the grass with a backhoe this time. Uh, you can see we're using metal edging. We wanna keep those grass roots away from our garden. Uh, we worked the soil pretty good the first five inches and uh, removed a lot of trash. There was historic trash in here, old Coke bottles. There was uh, that plastic mesh that goes down with so much sod, uh, that plastic doesn't biodegrade. It sits in the soil forever until someone like me goes and pulls it out. We've raked out a bunch of rocks, um, even though a lot of our species can tolerate rocky soil because we were using um, like a three inch drill bit for planting plugs. We didn't wanna get caught up in those rocks. So this is June of last year and we are almost ready to plant except we have to put in some of our sustainable landscaping practices like sheet mulching. So we learned from the first site at Main Terrain that some cardboard on the edges are really gonna help deter those Bermuda grass roots. So that's something that we learned from doing the first one uh, to get some thicker cardboard out there and I will say that having a, a backhoe bring your mulch right to you and spread it out in the gardens are the fastest way I've found the mulch. So if you can get that done, uh, that's great. As you can see in the background here, those are the smaller willow oaks. And then right here, that's that big one that was in the picture earlier. And so these small willow oaks definitely have lacanium scale from that earlier picture, just to give you an idea of how close we're trying to get this garden to those trees. Uh, these are really small insects and um, flying takes a lot of energy. And so the closer their food is to where they're going to make their babies, the easier this relationship will be. Excuse me, being able to site the garden close to these trees was very important just to show you how close we got. Um, so through all these phases of construction, Again, I start thinking about what I'm doing. Um, it's important to evaluate and question what you know about what you're doing. Uh, and I wouldn't consider myself a seasoned landscaper. I have about three years of, of practice under my belt. And we only pulled this off 
by working together. And um, it makes this project even more special that these divisions were collaborating effectively could make this a reality. You know, learning the hard work and everything that goes into managing land is a practice. Um, always learning new things, uh, learning from your mistakes. And uh, I've, I've said it before, sustainable landscaping um, is the way of the future. And I feel very lucky to be able to use my work, even though it's challenging norms and we can't expect our results to be the same. Uh, I think it's important to get comfortable seeing certain weeds in the landscape because a lot of those are beneficial to insects and the plants that, that we desperately need to survive. So practices like pulling the sheet mulch away when we're trying to plant and making sure that mulch doesn't get into the holes uh, ensures that when we do get to plant plugs, that there's really good soil contact with those roots. Uh, we don't want any air pockets in there. Similar with planting a big tree, you don't want to have a lot of air pockets. And so starting off the plants right is uh, an important first step when you're planting. Um, we were planting this in late June. And so we figured that we'd probably get some transplant shock because of the heat. Uh, but again, we were really confident that these plants were going to be able to take it because they're tough. They're they're made for, for this kind of environment. And so you can see uh, on the left, this is the day we planted and these plants are like upright. They've got really good uh, trigger pressure, lots of water in them. They've been watered, sitting in the shade for a couple of weeks. And then about five days later, I go back to check on the garden and things are looking a little yellow, a little limp, a little sad, but um, that's just the transplant shock and the heat. So this uh, concerns some of the neighbors we were in contact with, um, and they said that they were concerned that they were all dying, some of them were dead. We were really confident that these were gonna perk back up and we were like, some of them might die, but that's okay. It's, um, it's not really a bad thing to, to see them wilt like this. They're just responding to, to their environment and the changes. So this was about a month later in July, and they haven't grown very much at all, but we do see some, some leaves that are brown, and that's just normal dieback. Like over here, we've got some that look dead. These are flopped over. That's okay. Um, that's a normal response to the heat. Um, I probably look that way after I've been out all day in the heat. People were really curious about this. Uh, we got approached by a lot of people when we were working here asking for species lists. So I sent the species list to the Neighborhood Association so they could distribute it to people that were asking lots of questions. One of the things about, about this neighborhood is they were really excited to learn about why these gardens were going in. You know, I think they were excited just to see uh, public works doing something like build a garden, but people were actually really excited to learn that we were using these gardens to host insects to help trees because people said, oh yeah, I love trees. Yeah, we really need to be doing more of this. I'm so glad you're doing this. Um, so that was really, uh, really, really awesome. I, I didn't really expect such a positive response. I'm used to people looking at some of my sites and saying like, why don't you just mow it? That was, that was really a uh, positive reinforcement for me and wanted, made me wanna keep working harder. Imagine we planted this garden in June. This is what September looked like. So that drop in temperature, uh, you know, a uh, shorter photo period, um, you know, 10 degrees cooler, really made these things take off. It exceeded all my expectations of how well I thought this garden was gonna do its first year. And I just want to highlight some of the species here. We've got uh, this little blue stem, this kind of gray and blue grass coming up here. This purple flowery, um, that's the New England aster. We've got some little pink uh, echinaceas. It's probably purpurea. And then these tall, long spikes of showy goldenrod, solidago speciosa. In the foreground here, here's just one little spike up here with these little kind of yellowish balls over here. That is Rattlesnake Master, Eryngium yuccifolium. 
that's in the carrot family. We chose that one especially because of its bloom time is in the middle of summer, the hottest time of the year. And so it's a really important shallow open nectary flowers for, for those wasps. You'll see a cousin also in the carrot family, carrot family over here. That um, That's the golden Alexander, Zizia aria. Uh, it's got really great foliage uh, in the springtime and it's, it's an early bloomer. So this is already setting seed uh, way before this one even blooms usually. Um, right here in the foreground, that's Monarda fistulosa, that's uh, wild bergamot. I wanna point out over here, we had a volunteer that came in with another plant. Uh, that's Andropogon glomeratus, that's bushy broom sedge. That's one of my favorites. You can see it growing on the side of the road sometimes. Um, and that provides excellent cover for insects and the hollow stems are really good for, for hiding in the winter time. So looking at a landscape like this, you're like, who is gonna be able to take care of this? Who's gonna be able to maintain it? And that's a really good question to ask um, because being able to tell the difference between planted species, um, acceptable volunteers like this glomeratus, and then the weeds is imperative. Uh, we actually want these plants to fill in around each other and layer on top of each other so that they suppress weeds. And uh, native plant gardeners uh, or native plant gardens um, can have a formal look, but this is still a pilot and we're hoping to get feedback from people uh, telling us you know, if, if they think this is too unruly uh, if, if we need to, to hold back on the taller stuff, you know, whatever it is that we need to do change to make sure that this is a successful and acceptable uh, project to start doing all over the city. So this is from November. We left the stems standing all winter, like I said, to provide that, that extra shelter and habitat in the winter. A volunteer that was living just across the street who has one of those community garden plots um, was helping us water and weed, pulling out, um, pulling out the turf grass that was sprouting up here. And so I know that some people don't, don't like the unfamiliar look of these native plants. If you've ever seen any of the green infrastructure sites like at Warner Park or Patton Rec, people tend to think that they're not being managed just because the plants are taller than people are used to in the landscape, like just like, um, you might want really high functioning turf grass for your athletic fields. These are functioning to help with the greater ecosystem services for trees, for people, um, and any other landscape plant. This is really tricky. Uh, we want to be able to find a contractor that has a lot of knowledge in native plants. It's a problem to try to find those skills in Chattanooga. Um, and these are typically smaller businesses and it's harder, it's harder for us to work with them sometimes. Um, and we find that larger companies maybe don't have an expanded skill set that, that we need for projects like this. Uh, so we want to hire people with native plant experience that also have sustainable practices that are concerned about water quality. I just wanted to show you some of the highlights of the garden while we still have time. So this is uh, Coniclinum colistinum, blue mist flower. Again, look at these little tiny open flat flowers. This plant really surprises me by how cool the flowers look. It's a very cool icy blue color, but this blooms in the middle of summer. Uh, this one was got a late start because of transplant shock, but um, it always surprises me at how like the cooling effect that it has, much like the kind of bluish leaves on the little blue stem behind it have. Um, so even just like visually, it kind of cools me off to see this plant, even when it's growing in July. Oh, this is a really great fine textured grass, Nacella. Tenuissima, Mexican feather grass. This is actually one of the species that is not native to Tennessee, but it is native to the Southwest United States and Mexico. It's a cool season grass, so it blooms earlier in the year, but we love the way like this kind of fountain leaves come out of the ground. Uh, this one's really great for heat tolerant 
if you need a, like a heat tolerant plant, um, I've, I've told CDOT to use this on right of way plantings because I've seen it grow right next to like a concrete curb and it does just fine. Uh, over here on the left is that little blue stem again. This one has turned red in the fall. Um, you can see these plants and they, they're kind of like a rainbow over, this, over the summer and the fall. Um, even some oranges in there, especially when it gets, gets to be late winter. On the right is the Tennessee coneflower, tennis, Echinacea tennesseensis. This is a rare plant, but it was taken off the endangered species list uh, pretty recently. And so it is in production at nurseries. Uh, it's lovely. It's a little bit uh, rougher than maybe your Echinacea purpurea but um, it's also adapted for thinner soils. So if you have a really rocky place, that uh, Echinacea purpurea just may not tolerate, you should try Tennesseeensis. Um, it's got great flowers on it too. So all of this to say that we still need to do a lot of work on the back end. We need to monitor, checking the conditions, evaluating the effectiveness is really critical to the success of this project. We do plan on working with UTC to get students uh, to do science and research um, on IPM in the city. Uh, and Dr. Beasley is interested in helping with a, a baseline survey, survey of insects um, downtown Chattanooga, just to help us learn the basics because we don't even know what's out there. Um, I have some experience identifying insects, but I can't spend all my time doing it. Um, so really trying to reach out to uh, partners who are willing to research this is a critical component. Um, so that's what we're gonna work on. And we're already seeing some really good results. So these are some friendly faces that have popped up in the garden already. Um, here's a bee on, on the Tennessee Insis. And I'm not sure what kind of caterpillar this is, but he's looking really great. And uh, it's okay that he's eating some of the golden Alexanders. Uh, that's something that uh, we're comfortable with. Um, it's just part of providing food for these insects. Uh, I'm not worried about him eating the whole thing. That's a really big plant. Um, and that's a really big caterpillar. So it's probably actually about to stop eating and uh, start pupating. So some of the research that I did, uh, I came across some of our neighbors who are doing some really great research. So in Alabama, at their extension they're, they've got a really great resource on controlling scale insects and mealybugs. And uh, they've got a really great resource page talking about different IPM practices for scale insects. Um, one of them even mentions pressure washing trees that are heavily infested, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, but they've got, they mentioned so many other things, you know, the, the normal things like horticultural oils and timing, uh, you know, how to monitor for the crawlers. Uh, so they've got some great resources too. And also North Carolina State University has the Frank Lab, which has this website called ecoipm.org. And they're doing um, some really uh, foundational research in urban IPM. So this is where I spent a lot of time uh, looking at their peer reviewed articles and trying to understand how we could make this happen in Chattanooga. And um, basically you just have to start somewhere. So that's what the understory gardens are, is, is a start to something that is hopefully much greater and will build on itself. And um, it's just so important to manage our plants effectively and uh, learn from each other. Thank you so much. And I think we've got some time for questions. Lucy, thank you very much. I want to thank you and, and Pete for giving a presentation. I want to also thank Casey and John this earlier morning for their presentations as well. So Lucy, we did have one chat uh, question come in, and that was, how did you determine the size uh, for each of the planting sites? That's a really good question. Um, as far as size goes, I think it was just something that we felt was feasible to maintain. Long term, um, this being a pilot, we didn't know the size of the garden we needed, but we had a rough idea, like kind of following like the 80-20 rule, 
Like if you have, um, if you've got 80 trees in an area, maybe make 20% 20, 20 of that land area a garden. Um, it's probably a lot less than that for the sites we chose, but um, that's just a place to start. I had a question too. I live in Chattanooga and I, I often walk the trails down through, especially the Riverwalk Trail. It looks to me like they're doing a lot of planning there. I just wondered if how many more sites you have planned in the future. So we're still scouting for sites. Um, and a lot of that uh, depends on the, the staff that can manage additional sites because it's not that they require more management, it's that they require different management and making sure that we have people trained to do that. Uh, what part of the river walk were you on, Tom? Um, St. Elmo to, uh, to downtown. <laughs> I think that, um, they, I know that they're doing a bed right in front of the, the parks office right there. Um, they're gonna do an art installation right there. That might be what you see but I'm actually not not sure, but that has definitely been a site that we're interested in and uh, is is also a place that has some good natives that could be encouraged. And then if we, um, you know, if we take care of the exotic invasives along the trail there, like the, the honeysuckle and the privet, um, it could be a really great uh, showcase for, for native landscaping. Pete, Lucy, lots of great comments coming in for the pre presentation. So thank you all. It's really great to have you this year. And Oh, thanks. Right. The only thing I have to say is thank you to Lee and Lindsay and everyone else up there in Knoxville helping out. And thank you very much. Yep. Thank you all.